Hello everyone and welcome to Compress It Like an Idiot. This is a music, art, culture, technology pubcast that I'm trying out for YouTube. It's going to be a mixed bag of large groups and sometimes just one person. And on this occasion, that's exactly what it is. And I'm here with the fellow passenger who is a patron of mine. So again, uh, well, to begin with, <laughs> thank you for your support there. Uh, without people like you, I would not have been able to do any of the stuff that I think I'm doing right now. Um, and you're also a musician and a YouTuber and very active on social media and some other things, which I'm hoping to find out. So, Philip, thank you for joining me today. Nice to meet you. And thank you. And I, I would say, likewise, I don't think I would be able to make the music that I make today if I wouldn't follow your Patreon. Oh, as well. wow. <laughs> That's incredibly nice. Can, can, can beer be on display? Yes. Okay, good. Fine. Thank yeah, you very so much for having me. No, you're welcome. Um, yeah, it's uh, so I sort of put out a bit of a call for people who would be interested in taking part. And um, I sort of gave the option out for people to either hang out in the group, which you should you should absolutely do at some point, or if they just want to do it on a sort of one to one thing. So I thought, you know, you're, you're the first person um, that came up uh, in my list of results. Um, and as we discussed a minute ago, it's not actually the first time we've met because um, we met on a Music Hackspace Max meetup sometime a year ago. Um, but yeah, I've. It, it's, sometimes it takes me a little bit of a while to put uh, names together. Um, you know, people sort of appear, and then and then I'm like, oh, hang on, that's that's a patron of mine. I should like, I should start paying attention to what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I started like watching um, a lot of your YouTube's, and you know, it's clear that there's um, some common interests there to do with things like taking rather off the radar approaches to composition and sound design, um, particularly within the generative sphere. And um, I'm wondering if that's sort of something that you consciously decided to do um, just for YouTube, or if that's something that you do like across all of your musical disciplines, as it were. Uh, no, it's not at all just because of YouTube. I think it's just something that I've been super curious about just in general when it comes to art and all sorts of things, the whole generative approach. But it's also a bit of a, what would be the good term to use? I think I'm always sort of fighting the thought of, is, is it cheating to use a generative approach? Because there's something about it that I love. And it certainly allows me to make things that it's difficult to dream up. It's almost like you're in symbiosis with your equipment or your machine and things. And, you know, like the machine wouldn't be able to do it without you giving the input. But also I wouldn't be able to do it if the machine didn't do its thing. Uh, I saw, what's his name? Mylar Melodies. That's his name, isn't it? The, the guy yeah. who does all the Eurac stuff. And he, he talked about... Um, the generative approach and he justify it with that you me as a musician or in his case him as a musician that he is still the one who makes a decision that this is good and discards the 99.999 percent of the stuff that is almost unlistenable and yes that's true but i also don't think that we should reduce ourselves just to be that you know, like there is actually just a lot, quite a lot more that goes into it. And I think that the generative approach as a musician, the magic is perhaps less you being like a violinist or something who's really good at playing your instrument. You are the sort of engineer before the music sort of happens. <laughs> and that's that. It's just a completely different skill. And I find it super interesting. Yeah, it, it's very. In, it, it, I, I personally find it interesting as well, and even more, I find interesting the the kind of arguments that come out of it. So earlier today, I was I rewatched your video with the post-it notes, where you're sort of like, um, kind of like having a bit of an argument with yourself about it. Um, and there, you know, there were lots of things that came out of that that I was able to relate to some of my own experiences, mostly with YouTube comments that were in response to things that I've shared on YouTube that are like, hey, look, look what happens if you do this. Music happens by accident, mm. you know, and um, and it's not necessarily something that 
I consciously want to do in my own compositions. I actually just do it because I think it's just fun to do on YouTube, you know. Um, but the responses that I get along the way are always really interesting. And one sort of, like, th there's a slight kind of... Um, it, it's it's very tricky not to judge people in a YouTube comment. <laughs> right? It's very it's yeah. very hard. I, I, like I sort of sometimes have to kind of take a breath and go, I, I won't respond to that one. But uh, I think that there is a sort of um, a kind of belief system that certain people have that is music needs to come from sort of hard graft blood sweat and tears and all from from the human being and 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 that computer technology digital technology electronic technology is sucking all of that out of the traditional composer and i have to jump in and go well i'm sorry but actually it goes back to the 15th century mozart used to roll dice as a mm. parlor game and whatever numbers came up that was how he was going to go and improvise a piece of music right now you've got John Cage and his indeterminacy in like the 50s and 60s and all this sort of stuff. It's not a, a, a modern concept. It It's actually incredibly old. It's actually older than a lot of traditional music that we, that we know. And that's yes, kind of my counter-argument. <laughs> but, but, but I also think it, it's, it's, it's quite a different skill set. I don't think I want to be compared to someone who is just incredibly good at playing the piano or like composing in a what should we call it more a traditional sense because if they would give me some blank score sheets and i had to write it down i don't think i would be able to do it but likewise if i just gave them my setup and says like do something i don't think they would be able to do what i do either. they won't come out with the same result yeah, yeah, yeah. no uh but also do you have that where if someone is questioning what you're doing i just like one of the an early memory of that it was not music that i had made but i remember i had bought the prodigy's first cd album experience and somehow played it in the car and my dad asked like i mean this was literally 91 when it came out and my dad asked me have you paid actual money for this <laughs> I mean, yes, it's not generative. Yeah, it's it's not generative music. No, it isn't. But still, like, you know, someone questioning what you're doing, what you find interesting at the time. Like, I mean, I grew up in a small town in Sweden. And I mean, there was hardly anyone listening to any stuff like that. And I think that was also the massive appeal of just like, discovering like, what is this stuff? Like, where are these sounds coming from? And like much earlier than the prodigy as well, like, or yeah, so I would go maybe to a trip to Stockholm, which would have made when way more record shops than where I grew up. And you just like pick random records and just like, what is this? And I do remember uh, I picked, I picked, it was in a record shop in Stockholm and I picked the orb, of, what's it called, Pommes Fritz. I don't know if you know that album. It's, it's uh, no, not not that well. No, no, it's quite hard to listen to. It's strange, oh. and I listened to it in in the shop, and I hated it. But it was also interesting, and I just had to have it. You know, I just realized that I, I'm I'm going to listen to this until I it's, uh, until there is a penny that dropped, and it probably took quite a while. But yeah. yeah, I think that was always. I think sometimes it's more the the sounds also like. I, I, as a kid, being in a train station or an airport or something, and when you hear, when they're talking over the speaker system and you just hear this sort of echoing voices and like stuff like that, it's just like, and also we were staying at a friend's place when we was kids and they were living on the countryside and close-ish was a motorway. It was, yeah, quite far away, but you could hear at night, you could hear the lorry is like driving in the distance and it just like created this like Doppler effect sound like far, far away. And I was just like, wow, these sounds are just amazing. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're things that you can't unhear. Like I, 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 I remember being like really, really small and like really irritating my family and sometimes at school because I would just be going like that <laughs> and hearing like the phasing the phasing happening between like the, the the noise of my mouth and my hand as I move my hand further away from my mouth like that. 
I, I don't do that anymore, but I did it just then, and I, I can't hear it because I've got headphones on. But I like, it, it, yeah. or I would sometimes <laughs> go up to a wall and do it. It's just weird shit like that. But like, you 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 hear these things, and you're just like, what's going on there, you know? And um, it's the same response in certain types of certain types of music that that are, you know, going outside of of what we, I suppose, really what kind of popular music like kind of conditions us to expect. I've, I've always been drawn to also finding out like how, how do they do this? And also like this was like way before the internet and you just knew someone who knew someone who knew something about something. And I have no idea how old I was, but someone said like the thing to have to make beats is a TR-909. I didn't have any reference to exactly what sound that was at the time. And I was wondering like, is that what you need to make break beats? Like I had no idea what it sounded like and you just had to find out and then you discovered something and you heard something and someone, a friend of a friend managed to get a, a Novation base station just when they came out. And I suppose that was one of the first, what should we say like, an analog synthesizer that was all of a sudden released when there was no analog synthesizer had been released for many, many years. And I, he needed to borrow the equivalent of 50 quid in Sweden. And this is like, okay, I'll lend you that if I can have your base station until you pay it back. And I remember <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, I didn't have, yeah, I could record onto cassette. Oh yeah, that's, a, yeah, I remember. So in Sweden, there's a thing, I don't know if it's like that anymore, but until you're 25, you can you get free education evening classes whatever you want and the oh. local council had a studio they had a juno 106 uh, an eps eps 16 plus sampler and then there was some form of little roll and sound module and then atari with cubase on and you could just like you, you signed up and so you had we had access to it once a week. It was like three of us who would go there and sort of use this stuff. Had no idea, you know, like we were literally like just learning as we were doing. Sounds like a kind of rave after school club. Yeah, yes, and it had <laughs> it, it had it, it was in a sort of a um, what you what you call it like a youth club, and there was a room there with this stuff in, and it had two massive speakers in there, and we. Um, so they had a sampler, but we didn't have anything to sample from. There was a cassette deck and I was remembering where like we cycled home and used my old Amiga and recorded samples from the Amiga onto cassette and then took the cassette up to sample it into the sampler because that was the best we could do. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. just like incredibly lo-fi. Uh, and eventually, yeah, we, we did a couple of tracks on the Amiga and we got played on Swedish radio. The clip, my friend recorded on cassette. So it's 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 up. It's a drum and bass track, and this was like ninety five or something. It's on YouTube. I can send it to you. Oh wow! Yeah, we'll, under we'll a different it, name. Under we'll a different put it name. In the show notes. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very very early. Uh, not under the name the fellow passenger. Anyway. Cool. <laughs> okay, but I can I can maybe ask you a question because you grew up in this country in the UK. Yes, I didn't, and what happened in the sort of uk scene like for example i i know you 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 ref, reference a lot of warp artists in, on your youtube channels i know you know warp records like how how did people generally had they heard of the record label like in the 90s or like early 2000s or whatever like would people generally know who had they heard of Aphex Twin? Like no one in the town where I come from, like hardly. Yeah, we were a handful of people who managed to dig all this stuff out. Like, what was your? How did you get in touch with that sort of sound in the first place? Yeah, well, uh, for me, I I was in a pretty small town as well uh, for most of my life, um, and in my te in my teens in my as a teenager i was pretty much a straight up rocker it was all guitars loud guitars distortions martial amps and and stuff like that um but i i got kind of bored of it and i went to i, I went to a college to study jazz with a friend of mine 
But rather than actually study jazz, we actually ended up just taking ecstasy and listening to drum and bass and like driving out into fields in cars and listening to drum and bass in fields and stuff. That's quite far away from jazz. <laughs> well, it, well it, yes, it was. I didn't really, I think, I think it was a particularly bad, I don't want to slight the course that I was on, but it wasn't what I was expecting. It was a lot of sort of swing big band stuff. And I was kind of hoping for more of the sort of fusion 70s Herbie Hancock type stuff. But instead we were doing stuff from like the 40s and 50s and fours with the drummer and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, this is old people's jazz. This is cruise ship jazz. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say like either either it needs to go way further back. I mean, I got I got quite a lot of jazz records and either they are the sort of 70s stuff or it's like 1920s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, I, it, it really was, perhaps if I'd stayed there longer, it might have led on to that sort of stuff but i was i was really all about like um you know 70s wah-wah guitar with loads of psychedelic drums and stuff um which i've you know since gone on later discovered but conversely i was also mad into um what i was hearing in drum and bass and jungle and stuff like these break beats and all this kind of stuff and just being like what is that like why how is that so precise and satisfying, but it's uh, and and sounds so sort of human at the same time, but it's clearly not. This is and and that was when um, you know I sort of learned what samplers were really, and when I sort of understood what samplers were, then it kind of reconfigured my out, outlook on electronic music at that point, which which perhaps maybe had had an element of prejudice against it, coming as a sort of a purist teenage guitarist. I kind of thought that electronic music was like people pressing go and all that sort of stuff. But once I sort of like thought, oh, that you can you can sample something and sort of reinvent it, I looked at so many things differently, like hip hop and all this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I was sort of like a little bit curious about, okay, I, I mean, I'm... I'm still on the fence when it comes to dance music. There must be like some other stuff that's taking this idea a little bit further. And some friends of mine were like, yeah, well, you, you need to listen to Apex Twin. You need to listen to Square Pusher. You need to listen to Orteca and all sorts of stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. And I did. And my mind just went like that. It's, it's that's listening, it. listening electronic music, you know? So it, and, and that was that. And so through that, I, I started to, you know, in my social life, gravitate towards um, people who are also into that stuff. And I, and I had a group of friends who used to put on illegal raves and um, sometimes they drop some of this stuff or they play it like um, early in the morning, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And um, and that was the stuff that I was a little bit more interested in rather than the kind of hard techno or psychedelic trance that you would get at the peak hours. Um, and so... Yeah, so there were lots of people, even in like a my little small town, there were loads of people who were who were into that sort of stuff. And then every once in a while, we'd go to London and watch something, going go to a walk party in London or something. Um, so yeah, otherwise, I I mean, I wouldn't have discovered it by myself. I don't think there were there were people who were already into it. I, I think it's probably you were mentioning the sort of jazz thing, and the thing that you were faced with when you went to that school was the kind of jazz that you obviously were not into and I'm not either. And I think like the majority of electronic music is probably that too. You know, like I think for a lot of people, unless you just dig, you're not going to get to that. And you also need probably need to hear it in a particular context to just realize like, wow, this is, this is, there's something to this. Because if I would play a lot of the stuff that I listen to, let's say, I mean, to my parents or to some of my friends who don't, if they just hear it cold, like if they would sit in the office and put it on, they would just like, what the hell is this? You almost need to hear it in a bit of context or with someone who is like super passionate, like, and you can see their passion shine through when they sort of talk about it or play it. Yeah, I I think the, the thing is with jazz was that it seemed, for me personally, it seemed like the next logical progression as a guitarist and quite an able one. Um when I sort of gravitated towards the concept of like being able to improvise and sort of at the time as a, as it being in my late teens and going to watch bands who would just jam for, for, for 40 minutes, I would just be watching it thinking, how is this song still going? <laughs> and so like this, this idea of like, 
music can actually be something that you can just play indefinitely and have a nice time and it doesn't necessarily have to be structured or or something that everyone needs to be choreographed and tight with obviously sometimes that's good but that that sense of freedom that there is in in certain corners of jazz music was what was gravitating me towards it do you and think it would work with electronic music that you take the not the sound of jazz but the format you know like how you get um jazz mus musicians and you can almost like put a, a new group of people and it's more about like it's a really good drummer and you have a really good bassist and like they can go up and jam with each other that could you do the same thing let's say you have let's call it open mic but you've got like uh so and so on drum machine so and so on um modular and so and so on i don't know what else like <laughs> some like polysynth and someone and and you actually do jam sessions and a bit like in you get that sort of jazz club feel it doesn't sound anything like jazz but you get that format and you can almost like okay whoever does the modular they get their thing to do their solo for a bit and then you sort of get the applause after and then it sort of yeah, slips yeah, yeah, over yeah, yeah. and then you get someone who does their thing on the drum machine or whatever and, and you can say like okay you pick a key and everyone sets up their quantizers to that key or whatever and then the 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 person on the drum machine sets the tempo <laughs> i wonder if that would work as a sort of a live format well i i can think of some people who who have done things like that so they're, they're the the people who do crux in a crux av in london they they have these like jam nights where um, where are they? they they normally happen at new new river studios which is in i forget where it is it's in london somewhere anyway I I'll, I'll look it up i think it's in hackney or probably somewhere there's an industrial estate somewhere around there um i've been i've been a handful of times i can never remember where it is but they all kind of they all link up via ableton link so everyone's kind of everyone joins the ableton link network in the jam session and people can just come in and out and, and sort of do what they want um so certainly the possibility is there but th i think that's more kind of like a kind of dip in and dip out rather than it be kind of like working with that sort of again that sort of 1940s 1950s standard format of like we do the head now we'll have a piano solo saxophone solo then we'll do fours <laughs> with the drummer and then we'll play the head and the song's done <laughs> you know which like could be a fun turnaround for you know it's getting it's going to be nearly a century soon since this music's since well well not jazz but i mean jazz that we know it is probably going to be I just imagine the poster so and so. I just imagine the poster so and so on drum machine so and so on. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on uh, like yeah, um, so and so on uh, feedback loop. Yeah, yeah, and right, so and so on TB three o three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it could work. I think it could yeah. definitely work. But uh, I mean, so the getting back to that thing about the the sort of freedom that there is in jazz music, like. And again, again, to sort of bring that back to this whole conversation about generative music, for me, exploring gener generative music is is kind of giving me something um, within a similar vein that's kind of lacking uh, through doing stuff by yourself. Have I gone out of focus? Gone out of focus. There we go. No, still out. Still out of focus. I'll just have to stay out of focus whilst I finish my point. When when you when you work by yourself, um, often what's lacking is that sort of spontaneity that you get from playing with other musicians in that very loose scenario where no one's got any clear objectives or clear goals and you're just sort of messing about and then something might happen, someone might do something and everyone goes, that, that, do that again, you know? And the identity kind of comes out of that. When you work by yourself and everything is on your shoulders, um, that is sorely lacking. And exploring sort of generative approaches for me is sort of filling that gap where i'm offering a little bit of freedom to the technology to i'm sort of saying hey do something with this and it does it and i either go yeah that was really good or no that was shit do something again until i find something and that, that makes my brain go oh yeah that is like really good and then then i'll go away and i'll put my input you know against it in response to it or around it or whatever in order to develop it to something that has a little bit more identity and so yeah okay yeah yeah i was gonna ask do you when you make music do you just like okay hit record like 
just like do loads of stuff. You might pick up on a few things. Oh, that was quite cool. And it sort of develops. And then you just like have a bulk of material that you then reduce into a finished piece. Is that how you work? Uh, it really depends. Like when I'm working on something that I'm quite um, like that, I've maybe already sort of composed that I'm trying to realize through the, the process of producing it and mixing it. Um, that's a little bit different. I've kind of already, whether I've just sort of sat down at the keyboard or sat down at the guitar and come up with something that is the is the start of something that might go somewhere. It's it's a little bit more aligned with that kind of traditional approach I would take of of writing music where it's come from something that's come from my body <laughs> and my brain, you know. Um, along the way, um, I might put some things on it to decorate it that use these kind of approaches. But um, I'm not against the idea of making an album of like entirely gener generated stuff. In fact, I've, I've in fact I did one some time ago that was that had a lot of gener gener generative stuff in it. Generative is getting increasingly harder to say as uh, the more beers I drink. <laughs> <laughs> but like it, there there ha there definitely have been times when I've sort of tried to come up with maybe like I'll get Ableton to generate a chord progression and it might just do a certain voicing that I wouldn't have thought of or that I couldn't maybe even play because I'm not a very good keyboard player. And I hear it and I go, yeah, that that means something to me. I need to use that and carve that into something that's got more identity and is more personal. So, yeah, I, and I think that kind of links back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, it's it it's it's about it's about making decisions and it's about having confidence in you in your own ability to make those decisions to say what that hap what happened just then sounded really good um and also kind of like you know shaving off all of the extra stuff that doesn't really make any sense and normally when i do that what what i get left with is something that's actually quite simple it might just be like a little what's the word a motif you know mm -mm that kind of trigger something in my imagination. Um, yeah. I just realized that I think I want to respond again to a question that you asked at the beginning, which was something like, do you only do the generative stuff for YouTube? And I think the twist is that I don't think I have ever well, yes, sure, I have. And it's usually because of something I did for YouTube or something like that. But I think the generative process is more to create tools or starting points. I don't think I, I have ever done it with the intention of like, okay, I'm going to make an album now and the entire thing is just entirely generated. No, that... So I think... The thing for YouTube, it is the interesting aspect to explore because I feel like that's the, that's the part that is not so chiseled out as common music theory, I think. You know, like a, a lot of music, traditional music theory, there are loads of courses, there are books, but on this sort of stuff, there isn't that much. And I think there's probably a lot of theory under all of this, but it's 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 still quite an abstract um, sort of concept in order to kind of demonstrate with with people because it, it it's kind of excuse me I suppose I suppose it's kind of subjective because like you know if if you know I might listen to sort of like a thousand notes hammering away at nine 900 bpm and and think it sounds really great and someone else will think that's not music you know so in terms of what it offers to the creator it's kind of quite subjective but yeah but maybe in terms of like trying to explain the 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 benefits is a little bit abstract or at least what's out there is kind of abstract yes and i i I mean, I just went to one of the big bookshops in London, Foils, and I just thought, like, I'm just going to go and just have a little look what's there. And, like, obviously there's loads of books on traditional music theory, and there's some on this stuff, but I don't think any of those books, like, appeal to me, compared to your YouTube channel, for example. And I think the style of videos that you've done, how they have helped me is literally just 
opened lots of doors. And it's not that I, oh, I'm going to do the exactly what Ned Rush did in that video, and I'm going to make something that sounds exactly like that. It's more like, ah, I've never thought of, I can't think of a good example now, but, uh, you know, like you take the sampler in Ableton and you do some super tight envelope and you attach that to the starting point of the sampler. Like, I don't know, like there was sort of things like, oh, it's like, oh, I never thought about that. And then you sort of go in and that then leads me to think like, ah, oh, but what if I take that technique and then apply that to whatever else there is? Uh, and I found that super inspiring and it just like, then all of a sudden when you start somewhere and then it just starts unraveling and I would encourage anyone who looks at my videos and perhaps yours too that just I like, okay go ahead and give it a go but hopefully it will just make those people who watch like go off and apply that to their own thing or like you know see what that yeah you. And just just try it what's wrong in trying it yeah you don't, like it's it, it, you don't know what's gonna happen i mean it's sort of like i don't know if it's kind of like a lottery <laughs> but it is sort of like what what have you got to lose like yeah. i i just always think that i i'm always sort of saying to people that you know when you sit down to make music or to do music you don't necessarily have to make it you can actually just prat about and make weird noises and you know an experiment and just not have an end goal in mind and just think about like i'm just gonna you know, make a mud pie or whatever, just mix all the colours and just see what happens. Of course, it's going to come out brown. But, like, you know, just sort of, it's just, what's what's going to happen? I don't understand this. How does this work? Okay, what happens if I do this? Oh, this has happened. Oh, this actually sounds kind of quite good. You know, has it your, all kind of goes your, into the brain. Has your, let's say, like, in the last five years or something, do you feel like your music output has changed because of, just doing all these experiments has it led to something are you doing something today that you wouldn't have done years ago for example uh i don't know so, <laughs> um i'm not sure i mean at the moment i'm recording some i'm trying to work on some tracks that are all using the sh101 which is off camera i don't know why i'm pointing at it but like uh using the sh101 a for anyone who sh101 massive <laughs> Can I ask you just what just just yeah. what what happens? What's going on with the mod input? I tried I tried plugging like a maths uh, coming out of maths into the mod input. I, is that expecting a different type of signal? Because I just can't get anything out of that. I know it's, I know it's meant you, for the grip. You, oh yeah, I got the grip. Oh, you've got the grip. I don't have the grip. I just I don't have the grip. But I thought, oh, it's 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 the same size jack. I'll plug yeah. a Eurorack signal into it and see what happens. I get nothing. I have never thought about that. I I got the grip and I got the original shoulder strap as well. Right. But I have not worked out because the. I'm wondering is is the little one? What does it say? The is little one is is to is to connect the actual grip and then the mod is the signal that comes from the grip, which is effectively the same as what's on the pitch bend. Yeah, but is the, is the grip thing? Is that the electricity then? That would, my like, understanding well, would that's the voltage coming from the actual yeah. grip, and oh, okay. and and the the small. So CB is gate is basically like it was something like that. Like, I don't know. That's what I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah, but when I've tried to plug like a math signal from the Eurorack into into that socket, it, it nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, well, I was thinking of going on Facebook saying SH one hundred and one users. Can you confirm or deny that this will work? <laughs> like, do you know what? Like, if 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 you could work out what the signal is, could you turn it into what do you call it a melodica? So you blow into the SH one hundred and one. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that I would did, be. I have like a couple of times I accidentally because I'm I'm using. Uh, so yeah, to go back to what I was saying, I am trying to work on some tracks right now that are pretty much all the music i'm doing on the sh101 mm. um and so it, to kind of answer your question it's it's doing i'm making tracks that i wish i would have liked to have made 20 years ago when i didn't own an sh101 and so i'm not using any of the techniques that i've maybe built up through doing youtube over the last five five ten years or whatever i'm actually kind of just doing it super old school by like 
playing, actually just playing in multi-track audio. But sometimes, um, so I've got a Novation Remote SL Mark III here, which has CV and gate out. So I can send MIDI from Ableton to the remote out into the SH-101 and pretty mm. much um, trigger it from Ableton and record it back in. However, I'm pretty sure it's an entire semi semitone out of tune. So it's oh. all massively out of tune. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but it it's for me, it's more kind of like I'm just storing up this sort of database of like, when the time comes when I want to do that, I'll know I'll be able to do it really quickly. But right now I'm having a bit of an indulgence, self-indulgence thing of making tracks using only the SH-101. And you're making everything? You're making like the percussion and like all the sounds? No, not the percussion, just um, just like the, 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 the bass lines. Mm -hmm. um, obviously it's monophonic, so I can't do chords on it. So I'm playing in um, intervals from the chords in separate takes from the SH-101, um, sometimes triggering it from Ableton or sometimes just playing it from the keyboard. And then I'm kind of panning all the voices like really independently across the panorama. And it's it's sounding quite good. They're, and they're ever so slightly out of tune. If you put them all dead center, it just sounds like a sort of chorusy mush. But if you pan them like really hard against each other, it, there's a there's a sort of choral, there's a choral thing going on. And also because I was sort of opening and closing the filter differently on each take, there's all this kind of movement happening. It's it's quite exciting. I got, I got <laughs> an idea. Okay, this is super nerdy. Like, pretend that there is some pause music for two seconds. Some pause music. Maybe I'll edit this bit out. So, all right. So we can do this. If you got one. How many have you got? Two. You've got to. <laughs> so, so, so we could play chords, right? Like we can, if, if well, maybe not over Zoom, but let's meet up sometime. <laughs> we should work. I, I could do it down Zoom. It's plugged in. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, um, I, I don't have the. I, I, I need to go and find the power supplies. They are somewhere. <laughs> but... We could indeed do chords. Yeah. I mean, that that sort of the the thing was that was the first thing I thought of was that like I can't do chords. I'm going to have to play the chord in separate takes. Yeah. And actually what's come out of it has been quite satisfying. As and especially with the tuning instability and the and the tracking. I maybe I've not calibrated the the Novation keyboard properly or whatever. So it's all very out of tune. It's all very wibbly wobbly, but it sounds like really really nice. Bit of reverb on there, a little bit of crunch on the reverb as well. It's it's all sounding pretty good. But yeah, so it's kind of like I'm I'm kind of doing a Brian May, I suppose, on the SH101 by recording all these layers separately and you know i could do it all in one take on a polysynth in a vst or something but there's That's something not the point. <laughs> it's not really the point the point is is sort of like it's it's like i've got the thing and i've made the decision that i'm just going to use only that for all the music which means that if i want to do harmonies this is the approach I'm going to have to take. I'm going to have to record it in separate layers. It's like a sort of a dogma type thing. But I also think that the, I may regret saying this, but let's say I had to get rid of all my equipment. Like, okay, not the laptop because that's like a sort of an essential piece. But if I had to get rid of all my other gear, I think the SH-101 would be the last one to go. Yeah. In my opinion, because there's something about the sound. I can't put my finger on it. Like, yeah, if I sit there and compare, I don't know, like some some YouTubers sit there and like compare the sort of uh, waveforms between synthesizers and stuff. Like, I'm not interested. I just know that it sounds good. And yeah. so I'm in total support of what you're doing, even though it's hard work. But it's one of those <laughs> things that is hard to justify to someone who doesn't get it. It, like or it was just like oh why why don't you just get the tal whatever it's called you know vst because that's a really good i i've never heard the behringer ones but you know i'm sure they're fine but it's just not the thing and also i think a quite I, th I think a musical instrument like this if you i don't think the if you compare buying a vst or getting a dodgy copy or whatever your plan is there is never as much of a story to that 
compared to acquiring a physical instrument and the sort of like i know this is just sounds super nerdy i this is quite a while since i bought my uh first eight sh 101 the other one is actually not mine it's on loan because he moved um overseas but i've had it in my possession for like i don't know six years or something so one, i only own one but i bought it i was living in australia at the time like work was just absolutely going pear-shaped and there was a day where it's like okay either everything will just go to pot or things will work out but if things just like don't go well today because i'd seen it in like in a second hand shop and it's like i'm just gonna go and buy it like and I did. And so it's so like the instrument itself comes with more of a context and a story. And also like at, around that time, I bought a TB303 and so found it, it's really good condition. And I was going to go, I had to go to a suburb in Sydney. It was really run down, but there was this one building that looked brand new. Okay. So that was the address. I went there, went to the top floor. And this sort of beautiful Japanese girl opens the door and they got one of those uh, cats without fur and you step into the apartment and there's a, uh, everything in there looks super expensive. It's like this sort of huge projector and it's like, who is this person? Like, what's the story here? Like in this dodgy neighborhood, this brand new block of flats in the penthouse in there. And then he has this setup with this like pristine looking vintage synths. And I was buying the TB3 and it's like, okay, do you like, is there any other equipment that you need? It's like, is there anything that you use? It's like, I was, I didn't know what to say. It's like, yeah, one day I would love to have this Roland Space Echo. And it's just like, yeah, I can, I can get you one of those, you know, wow. like, where, where, where is this stuff coming from? But there's like that instrument that comes with that little story. It was not just like, a, a, and I don't know, it probably doesn't affect the sound. It's super, super nerdy, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I mean, my, my story is not quite as interesting, but it is a story. And I, I was, you know, it was just around about Christmas and I was just, I was really bored it was Friday evening and I had, I had way too many drinks and I was just on eBay and an SH-101 popped up and it was quite reasonably priced. It was sort of like, okay, that's not cheap, but that's not mega expensive compared to how much I've seen, the, seen them and go you were, for. You, you, your mind was weak enough because of the drink, so you pressed buy. Is that what happened? I, I, I made an offer. Yeah. I made a couple of offers. He said no, and then I just went, right, I'm just going to buy it. And it, like I say, it was not mega expensive it wasn't cheap but it wasn't mega expensive i've seen them go for nearly twice what i paid for it gosh but i still paid quite a lot for it so, so it was, I was well, well of, it was well under a thousand pounds well under it was under a thousand pounds it was more than 500 pounds but it was under a thousand pounds i've seen them go for like 1800 1800 pounds um two thousand pounds from japan on ebay and i'm just like no, I can't justify that. On this occasion, I kind of thought, yeah, I can. One of the uh, faders is missing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but um, when I got it, when it arrived, I think I, I, I turned it on, uh, I think maybe four hours, just vanished. I was just like, the, it, even, just, just with the headphones, just going straight into the headphone socket, like raw. I still, I still the have the... It was, I mean, a super early YouTube video, but it was literally, I had just bought it and it's like my first literally plugging in it and jamming. And <laughs> I think funnily enough, I think it's the, 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 the YouTube video with the most views. I think it's got like 60,000 views or something. And oh, wow. it's literally just like <laughs> making baselines on the SH-101. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a little bit of, I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of nostalgia yeah. for it because of, of the, the records that it's been on. But I think there's a huge amount of nostalgia there for people who have owned one because once upon a time it was probably just quite an affordable thing yeah. to have. It was basically like a Casio home keyboard, you know, like anyone could really get one and everyone did and then got rid of them. Because, um, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, again, yes, I mean, when I bought it at the time, it was not sort of cheap as chips, but there's like stuff that I have today that I wouldn't buy a TB303 today. Like I just couldn't justify the price. The same thing yeah. with with the, the I eventually got a Roland Space Echo, but the prices they go for today is just like yeah. I mean that I 
it, it's funny, isn't it? I, it I was sort of the, the last week I've sort of trying to be to, to work on something for for a future YouTube video where I'm sort of like trying to see if I can recreate a lo-fi tape, home cassette tape, mm. just using Ableton stock plugins with the intention of sort of like going on YouTube and going, right, I'm going to show you how to do that lo-fi sound. It's really easy. You don't need to go and buy all this stuff. You can just do it with your stock stuff because that's part of my thing. And... I was kind of thinking, like, how much is a four track? How, mu how much is like an old Tascam four track from 1998 or something? They're like three, four hundred pounds on eBay. It's it's ridiculous. I swear some of them are more are, are, are going for more than they than they were new in the 90s. Mm -hmm. It's it's such a, a crazy sort of thing that that. Yeah, that history just basically rewrites the value of stuff, <laughs> particularly with like technology and things. And the, the the space echo is a good example. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure maybe it's already happened. Like cathode ray tube TVs will probably become a thing, and they will be, you know, become <laughs> expensive. Yeah, yeah. And then there will be some company who starts making them again or something for some ridiculous amount of money. I don't know. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny old game. I sometimes think about. You know, I kind of thought like, oh, maybe I would quite like to have a, like a four track just for that sort of, you know, there's something about being able to interrupt the tape whilst it's recording, mm -hmm. you know, kind of nudge the pause button or wiggle the track, the, the pitch control whilst it's recording that can bring out some things that are quite tricky to do with computers, let's face it. But um, yeah, I, they're just way overpriced. <laughs> I, I don't know what it would be with the SH 101, but I was thinking about a lot of other vintage gear. I have a plan for, I don't know if this, I think in theory, this should work, right? So I got, I got an Alpha Juno one. Mm. And is it there in the room? It is. Well, it also actually happens the guy who lent me or who's who I'm babysitting the SH 101. I'm babysitting here so it happens to have two in the room all <laughs> oh, right can you I'll, like orientate the camera at all to I'll, i think it's easier i'll just go and pick it up okay <laughs> <laughs> welcome to synth porn with ned rush and the fellow passenger wow you got a lot of um oh i forget my name now Right. Maleko, Maleko stuff. Yeah, go on. Ah, oh, okay, right, yeah, yeah. This uh, uh, looks digital. It is, do you know Do you know about this thing? I don't know much about the Alpha, Alpha Juno, no. It is very similar to a Juno 106. It's got uh, digital oscillators and it has got an analog filter, I believe. I think the sound this is most famous for is the Hoover sound. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. where, uh, came from this. Um, and yeah, like Charlie of the prodigy, that sound or dominator or some of those. So it's like, I think it's one of those, like it was super cheap. When I bought this, that was actually cheap. I probably bought it for like 120 quid or something. They go for way more now. When was that? In the 90s? Uh, it might have been, it might have been sort of 98, 99, something okay, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've also recently, because it doesn't have the sliders, this is not the original. This is a, a replica. The original one is super expensive. And it was something that was sold separately to the synth. So you have, you get access to all the sliders and the, the filter and everything. So you don't have to go through that stupid, it's like a jog wheel, whatever. It sounds right. amazing. I still think it's incredibly affordable for such a good sound. So like if you want the Juno 106 sound, but don't have money to buy a Juno 106, I think this is, uh, and then buy one of these replica things. Anyway, what I wanted to do with this was something that I think would have been, I'm not sure I'm saying the right thing here. I think it would have been really difficult to do back in the day that you then take lots of Max for Live devices like LFOs, envelopes, whatever, and then you just like modulate the shit 
out of all the parameters live on that thing and yeah. just like make sounds that it wouldn't have ever been meant to make originally yeah you know what that's interesting that sort of set something off in my brain like there there are some things you know now that it's sort of um technology and trends just move forward mm. like the idea of of um sort of hacking into something that's maybe a little bit old um uh, to sort of see if it's almost got the capacity to accommodate modern techniques because like you know there are certain types of sounds that maybe we like to make now that people didn't want to make in the 90s or the 80s and so the the mindset wasn't necessarily to to design instruments in order to accommodate that because no mm -hmm. one was into that stuff so to be able to take an old piece of equipment and kind of mutate it using like modern approaches like yes yeah, so like, there's definitely yeah. something there in that. I, I think it would be interesting to test and i think what gave me the idea i just heard someone told me i don't know it might be on the internet it might be true i don't know that or Tekka did something they had i don't know if it was the old midi verb or something like rack effects and somehow super fast just like went through the different presets but live as the sounds were playing i mean they were sort of using it in a way that it was never intended to do and i thought oh gosh but there's stuff we can do now that you couldn't even do then because you couldn't just have all of a sudden 10 lfos or something at your disposal that you could just yeah, like yeah. modulate the hell out of every parameter and just see what what happens when you do that yeah 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 completely and to and to sort of offset them all at different times and mm. yeah i mean that was actually um I used to have one of those like really crap like Zoom. I think it was like the 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 nineteen ten or something like rack mount um, studio effects. They were like you can buy them for like. Oh, 10 I, hours. I, I I got a twelve oh four. Yeah. So, so one of those things, you know, yeah. just like very affordable from the nineties. And I somehow acquired one, and I had a mixer at the time, and I ran the uh, I ran it into the mixer. Uh, so I, I basically did a, a feedback loop with the mixer and um, just whacked the gain up on one track just to get some surface noise out of the mixer and ran that into the reverb um, to, to create the feedback loop and then just started changing the algorithms whilst it's in the feedback loop. Oh, yeah. And like wow. it's like all this stuff just came out like fireworks. There were just all of these things coming out because every time that like you change the algorithm, the feedback loop has to reorientate itself to this new process that it's currently going through. <laughs> I do it in Ableton like all the time now with the hybrid reverb. But um Oh, what do you mean? Like I haven't tried that. In short, like what's the brief description of what do you do? So you use I'll, the hybrid um, reverb. I can show you. So yeah. if um can you see that? I can see it, yeah. So if I get like if I get like the hybrid reverb, um, put it on a return track here, enable all the sends so that I can feed it back into itself, put a limiter in there, get oh, like yeah. um get the vinyl distortion, get an LFO, put the LFO to random, set the hybrid reverb to algorithm, and then I'll map the um the LFO to the algorithm. Oh gosh, yes, this and is then, exactly it. This is what I mean. Like I haven't thought about this before. So this is just really good scene. It's like, oh gosh, what else can I do that with? Yeah, exactly. Anything that's just got a switchable algorithm, I think is really worth exploring. So, oh, hang on. Now we don't have any sound. I can, have. Can, oh, you can hear that. Why can't yeah, I Yeah, yeah, this, this sounds like Pole. I don't know if you've ever listened to Pole. I, I do know Pole, yeah. Good stuff, <laughs> going back a bit, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, so now as I start to feed this back, Oh gosh, that sounds like super musical.
So it's kind of like this mutant robotic space shifter type idea. And then you can just like chain up like three resonators that run in parallel and you can create chords and all sorts of stuff. Gosh, okay. Yeah, you could absolutely, absolutely do that. You know, that's like, that's, that's one of like my favorite sort of starting points. If I'm sitting down and I like don't have any ideas, but I want to make something, I'll make like a feedback loop of like loads of modulating processes, record a very long sample, and then chop it up. I, and that's you like know my what, like, I, I actually that I, I posted a video for the first time yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, but I've started, well, something I've done for quite a while is like, this is yet another example of that. Like, let's say you want to make music and you actually have a bit of time, but you just like have a blind, your brain is blank and you don't know where to start. But like, just do something like this so it throws something at you that you can then respond to. And all of a sudden, then you can pick bits out and it will develop into something. Yeah. Because it's better to do some music rather than just, oh, I don't know what to do. I can't come up with any good chord progressions or whatever. Yeah, like it, exactly. Um, it, you, you don't know where it's going to lead you, you know, and you don't know what it's going to trigger in your imagination. And that's sort of, you know, that's absolutely why i'm a kind of advocate if you will of like mm. falling back onto generative ideas when you don't have any ideas and to me it's kind of like collaborating with the technology you know seeing what the what the technology can offer you and then again it, we're going back to this whole thing about you know i've got I, i'm i'm still in charge <laughs> i've got yeah, to decide yeah. what's good and what's not good but do you have a feeling for i think i mentioned it in my sort of post-it note video there but like when That little chain that you set up now, it was not as if you have gone and bought that as the feedback reverb plugin and you just keep clicking it. Like I, I kept, not anymore, but I kept getting the superior when I got these, not monkey drummer, but something that, drum monkey, something like that, where you could just like, okay, you just click a button and it will just generate new beats for you. For some reason, I, I wouldn't find that particularly rewarding for me i want to do there needs to be that moment of like oh gosh what happens when i do this you know like yeah, that's yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, um you know when i watched that video that post-it note video again today and I, I was reminded of sort of like conversations that i've had in the past about this um and then and, and also sort of feeling quite frustrated in, in two ways one because of just getting upset about people who aren't appreciative of of generative ideas and youtube comments i get on my videos mm -hmm. but then also getting upset about how um that no one is <clears throat> that, that, that 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 i have this belief system that young people are not they don't think that they need to know anything in order to to make stuff because it's the the technology is there to kind of hold their hand mm -hmm and how frustrating that would get me. But then I would very quickly kind of call myself out and think, well, actually, I had a Casio keyboard in the 80s that had auto accompaniment, and I would sit there and just press buttons and it would make all this music. And I thought that I was great, <laughs> you know, but like what it actually ended up doing, this was when I was like seven, you know. Yeah. And so, but what that ended up doing was that that kind of gave me, that shaped a little bit of literacy. And I think actually people eventually, their, their intention is, is that they do want to get better they do want to get better musicians. They want to get better producers, composers, and stuff like that. But it's just that the the I, I don't I don't necessarily think the times are changing. I think it's it's just the interface and the technology is changing. So going back to sort of like home Casio home keyboards, the kind of the 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 sort of consumerist you can make music in your front room like kind of marketing that you would get with some of these things in the eighties, and perhaps even the seventies. I can't be certain, but certainly in the eighties. It's the same sort of motivation to get people to buy stuff, you know. Explore yeah, I think you I think be you're a musician. Yeah. I think you're right. And there was something for the, for the Super Nintendo, wasn't there? Like you could sort of make music. And the thing is, like, I don't think anyone like they would buy the Casio keyboard and enjoy it, and then just like they're stuck there and they use that for the rest of their life. Either they give it up and just find another hobby, or yeah. they're going to move on and learn and build on that. So if, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. So the drum monkey thing, if that gets you over some form of threshold of making something, that's probably a good thing. 
But if you would just like, okay, I'm just going to press the drum monkey button. I don't think everyone would get bored if that would be their music career from then on. <laughs> yeah, and um, and it's also kind of like it 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 sort of depends on on the context of the user and the the you know you mentioned the the midi pack thing and you know i've kind of had my own little journey with my criticism regarding that 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 the whole midi pack thing and the marketing is that you don't need to know anything because everything is here ready for you to use and me, who's put quite a lot of my personal time and energy into learning this stuff, finds that a little bit frustrating. But I'm not in a position right now where I need something immediately. And there are people who are. There are people who are maybe writing library music, who are writing things for other people who are being contracted to deliver something in four hours. They haven't got time to, to write a chord progression. They literally just need someone's there going, we need it to sound like this. They go, okay, bosh, 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 done, you know, and I can kind of appreciate that, like, because that's a certain type of context, like if, and I think that's where the marketing for the, for the MIDI pack kind of suffered a little bit because they are a little bit like, it's, it's kind of like, uh, don't worry, everyone. You don't need to know the difference between a major chord and a minor chord, which is like, the easiest thing to understand if someone explains it. Mm -mm. They're just here, just take them. And yeah, that's sort of... I suppose it's exactly the same thing with like presets, isn't it, in synths? Yeah, yeah, I I love making my own sounds, but for someone like, all right, I'm making this thing for a TV ad, I just need... I need it now. Whatever, yeah, Yeah. and that one sounds good enough. Yeah. Yeah, 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 completely. It's, um, it's, uh, It's fascinating. Even a little bit of foam on top of there. <laughs> so maybe um, we could um, talk a, l- a little bit more about what you're doing on YouTube. I saw that um, this week you uploaded a new video after quite a long period of not doing that. And yes. um, there was you, you were imposing constraints on yourself. So if setting these limitations, I'm going to do this, but it has to be within these confines um, which is like a pretty interesting and, and healthy exercise. Um, but yeah, I'm just sort of curious, like, is there anything that you're gravitating towards, especially right now in Ableton, that's floating I, your I, boat? I, I, I think, oh, just to give a bit of context to that, I think there was a period during lockdown where I wasn't on furlough, but the pace at work really slowed down and all of a sudden I actually had a bit of spare time. Was this at and, the science museum, did you say? Yeah, that's right. Science museum. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, cool. And I decided that I am going to make, I'm going to use a bit of time now to actually sort of make some music and I just need to get into, I'd read this book about habits and I thought like, okay, I just need to get into a habit of just making something all the time. Even if it's literally just like, if I only got 10 minutes, like do something. And I, I made this challenge for myself. This was before I started doing the YouTube videos. I um, decided to do 100 days. My, my mission was to do 100 days of a, an Instagram post every day of one minute's worth of music. And I also like the idea of, because on Instagram, I think if you just do a, say, a regular post, one minute is the max. You yeah. Know, like, so, so there's, not... there, there's, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain um, like limitation about that. I mean, obviously, nowadays, you can go longer if you want to. Yeah, but yeah. there's something about that limitation on Instagram that is kind of appealing. It is. And it's also like, yeah, it, it's, and especially if you do generative stuff, like making a minute's worth of music is not, it's not that hard, really. No, no. You know, like you can, <laughs> and and I think it was also like I, it. It ma- the process made me a lot faster, and I started off doing Ableton stuff, and then because of lockdown, I moved into my partner's place, and I brought my sort of some of my music gear. I brought my sort of little modular set up, and it sort of ended up that I set up modular patches that. Uh, and I think it sort of started somewhere around there. And 
I, the penny hadn't quite dropped, but it somehow like I realized that this whole generative approach, sitting down with constraints, the ambition is not to make a full on composition, but it really started speeding up my learning because like just doing it made me you start off with what you know, but in that process, like in every, not necessarily in every single video, but or like every clip that I did, you come up with something that I, I want to try this. Like it doesn't necessarily need to be something groundbreaking, but all of a sudden, like you start moving and you're learning things. And I think even though I didn't keep posting those daily videos on YouTube, uh, on Instagram, I, I did it for a period last year, but then work got just too much. But since then I've, I've used that like literally even if i got 10 minutes i can do something the intention is not to do a finished composition but you sort of add to your repertoire of skills i suppose yeah uh because i can really see like three years ago my sort of go-to of doing things in in ableton is different from my go-to things so i know that i've developed or changed in some way whether it sounds better i don't know uh, and I think it's still that and now getting back into it since I have uh, left my job and now I've got a little bit of time on my hands during the summer, like diving in there and starting doing those exercises, especially because like, all right, gosh, what shall I do now? It's sort of a bit of pressure. The pressure is on and it's just been a really good method. So I have I've prepared another five of those videos, but just like showing another bunch of different constraints, like so another one that is coming up um is just using the analog in ableton only one track and i'm not allowed to resample but trying to make all the it will just be a loop but just all the elements so uh i can try to do it live now or is that just yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah do it do it Absolutely okay. do it. I, I'm not gonna promise that I succeed, uh, but I, I just want to show fine. the show the theory. So uh, let me just make sure that I got this set up properly. So we get the Zoom audio. Okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Boom. Boom. Share audio. Fine. Share. Am I sharing? You are sharing. I see it. You see it. Okay. So just to prove the point, I'm allowed to use effects, but I'm not allowed to resample, right? So, okay, so this is there. So we go into here and we pick analog. Can you hear that? Yeah, I hear it loud and okay. clear. I'm just gonna make a, a little sort of four bar loop or something. So we need to, so we need a kick, right? Like we need, it needs to have some form of bass. It needs to have some form of beat. Uh, it needs to have some, you know, like maybe some some form of melodic content, and I'm only use allowed to use this one track. Uh, so it's never ever going to sound particularly good, but that, that's like sort of beside the point. And we can also make sure that we create a bit of variation. I'm just going to pick some random. Let's say that's that's our. Uh, Beat. Uh, and let's say that we want a bit of variation. So we go into, come on, there we are. We change the chance. We probably all always want the first kick to sound. I'm, I'm, I'm very frustrated with that chance editor. I think it, I think it still needs a little bit of work. Yes. I think I, it would be nicer to, to actually like, if you click on a, sorry to, to, yeah, no, go on. to interrupt but like if you if if you if you actually click on a note and hold command you can adjust the velocity of the clip it'd be you nice can. if there was like a shift command or another oh, yeah, keyboard yeah. just to just to adjust the chance because that lane editor is it's not there yet for me i'm afraid no not quite. it needs more it needs work <laughs> anyway carry on all right so then let's like okay we probably need to have some form of sine wave with let me see like is that playing now in 120 because that's just <laughs> uh all right so there we are really but that's the tempo of life man <laughs> well, yeah. that's why that's why everything defaults to 120. can we go down we need we need to okay we're starting to get into some sort of kick territory here yeah and then we probably need 
some form of snare, right? Are you going to do this all in one instrument, or are you going to layer yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All in, yeah. I'm only right. allowed to use this one. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Is this getting too nerdy now? No. 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 I. I. I dig it. I. Okay. I. I. I kind of. I, that was the first thing I was thinking. Like, is he going to do it all in one instrument? Okay. And obviously, we need um, for this to sound more like a snare. It's going to need noise, right? Like. Yeah, you want a sine sound. wave and a, and a noise. Yeah, You're so automate. We, we, we only turn, we automate the noise. Yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. There. I see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we probably don't want too much volume there. It's probably... It doesn't quite sound like. Do we want to automate the. The decay there. We probably want these to be a bit shorter <coughs> anyway, don't we? Actually, let's see what. Okay, so we can do that. And then, so we have to shorten the decay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, good enough. I mean, it illustrates the idea. <laughs> and, th and then we need to get a hi-hat out of this, right? So we need a constant noise source. So if we take, uh, let's then go into here and then we take the vocoder, but we group that and make two lanes, so one is... I thought you said you weren't going to use any effects. Oh, effects are fine. Effects are fine. Oh, effects. Oh, okay. All right. I miss. I misheard. Yeah. So, so this, 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 this is, uh, this is just the, the raw signal. So the other one has got... Yeah, the vocoder is a great way to just embellish percussive sounds, you know? Yes. I, yeah, I, I think it's can sometimes almost be used as an alternative to reverb. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah Like yeah. you use like sort of a, a noise decay rather than... It's like, a, it's like a really dry reverb. So then we can have that. And then we have... Uh, um, where does the LFO live? Uh, there, modulation. Modulators. And... In the modulator. Yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. Yes, go for it. And then you know, we... you, you you can change that out if you don't want them in folders. What do you mean? If you right click somewhere in there, go yeah, un disable group in folder. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you learn something new every day. Okay, so we want that as a square, maybe, and then we want that to sync, and then we just do that with the. Probably want to offset that, otherwise it's going to be ridiculously loud. What depth is that? Oh no, gosh, yes. Yeah, that doesn't. Why is that not in sync? Is that because the? Oh, it's because of the offset. Hang on. I'm not really succeeding here. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Just I mean, you get you get the idea. I, I should probably stop here, but like there will no, be no, a no, video. No. I, I think you should keep going. Keep going. Just okay. Keep, it's fine. Uh, I'll 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 do a little bit more. Okay. So we need a baseline somehow as well. Then let's try and do that. Uh, there will be a full video coming out of this, like where I've spent a little bit more time uh, on it. But let's see. Uh, so we need to go back there. And how do we need to do baseline? Um, it's the tricky like, thing here. You, you, sorry? Oh, sorry, go on. No, carry on. I was just saying the tricky thing by doing this, like you have to remember which notes in here of the uh, <laughs> of the bass line. I mean, yeah. what you could do, what you could do, you could actually. The other thing you can do is using uh, sort of Max for Live sequencers or something, and then at least sort of separate which one is doing what, just to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> It's sort of like, um, it, I've tried it a couple of times. When I had the Make Noise O Coast for a little while. Yes. How, how um, did you find it? I've never tried it, but yeah, go on. I, I, did, really, I, I, I did really like it. Um, and so what I, 
what I would try to do with it, and I've tried this um, with the SH-101, but it's much harder, and I've tried it in Eurorack like loads of times, is that, yeah, just trying to get as much as you can out of a single voice, out of a single single mono uh, oscillator. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I call it like mono raving. <laughs> so <laughs> like on, on Eurorack, I would kind of like, y- y- yeah, in Eurorack, you kind of have to use a lot of VCAs and a lot of... Um, I, I don't have any se- sequential switches or anything like that, so I would I would kind of have to use all the VCAs and use various gates from a sequencer to open and close the VCAs, which were u- which were piping in modulation sources to ultimately w- what would be a single sine wave. Yeah. So I'd have a curve coming in to do a kick drum and then a blast of noise to modulate it to you know, and ju- it, it's like it's definitely a really rewarding like exercise and and you'd be surprised the the results you can get i didn't push it that i remember you saying i i I, it was when i had just started my modular journey so i had a just the dope for standard vco um and wanted to get both some melody and, and a bass line and i used a clock divider to pitch the oscillator down <laughs> this is things right. like that i mean it, yeah it sort of becomes sort of a square wave but yeah yeah you, you can you can that was the wrong I did the wrong notes i don't want to change the snare there's these ones that i want to turn into square waves um, is that one as well the worst melody I've ever written in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, but I can hear where it's going. I can, I can hear what... And then you can obviously go in and sort of start modulating the, the filter as well, but you have to sort of go and do it on a sort of micro level and then just finding... And then also, I think a, a great thing in Ableton are these where you create all these parallel paths. And I, I experimented doing it on beats and things where you just like if you have a break beat and then you don't necessarily want to affect the kick drum but you want to do the other thing so you just create three parallel uh frequency bands i suppose like of the same beat and then you add reverb to the top and delay to the middle and then you keep the or you, or you just saturate the bass or whatever you know like and then start squeezing things out of it and i wanted to do that on Eurorack. Uh, so I've got something, a module called LR4, which does exactly that. It's just like you put, there's one input, but it splits out, splits it into three separate frequency bands, which you can tune and then send it off to sort of do that sort of thing. Yeah, interesting. I don't know if you've ever tried kind of like, um, uh, just talking about having things in multiple chains, um, you can apply like a crossfade to the chain selector. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can actually assign an LFO to the chain selector and get like get get it to kind of morph, pseudo morph between lots of various chains of things that are happening. Um, that's, I'm wondering that's if I'm kind of quite cool. I'm like, wondering in, in a feedback loop as well. That's really really exciting. It was something I used to do quite a lot, and I'm just wondering if I've actually learned it from. I'm just going to stop sharing for a bit. Uh, I'm wondering if that was something that I learned from you originally. Oh. Um, <laughs> what happened? No, no, no nothing. I, I was oh, yeah. just no. I, I, I think that that I used to do a um, like an effects chain and have lots of effects, and then you have. Actually, I'm wondering if I even had my own. Bear with me a second. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, Presets, audio effects. So I set up long effects chains, and then I I I, I love using. I overuse it. I use it too much. I should almost challenge myself not to use it. Um, that on any MIDI input that it just like spits out a random number, and you would just jump in between the effects chain so it's not really crossfading in my case it was more like just jumping between effects and it just like create these really chaotic things yeah i yeah so i did uh, a couple of sort of presets because it was also a time when 
Have you come across glitch machines? They do sort of VST plugins. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got their stuff. Um, I it, it's like really, really, really good. I, I I sometimes struggle a little bit with the UI. Yes, I I agree. And it feels like yeah, sometimes it's cryptic and like a thing is just represented by a letter and it's a lot. But I I, I think before it's really, I had they're really good stuff though. Really, yeah. like really onto something. I I I. I downloaded a few of their free things and then i purchased a couple of their effects when they were on sale so you just got them for a few quid whatever but it was also a period when i felt like oh gosh i can make my own sort of glitch machine by setting up these like effects racks that sort of and it was not it, the intention was never to copy any of them but it was literally like when you watched the tutorial which was my only way of actually like what the hell is going on here you know you found the youtube video where they explain so for anyone who's watching this now if you haven't checked out glitch machines just google it they're vst plugins that yeah yeah i'm i'm i i mean i'm i'm kind of like in communication with uh oh i forget his name now i think it's ivo evo um we, we we've had a couple of chats and i I'm, I'm thinking about i'd like to get him on at some point i've got this huge list of people that i'm aspiring to to get on including maybe the midi pack guy i think i'd like to get the midi pack uh, guy yeah on. i mean yes yeah 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 like you just have a take that approach where you're just like i'm just open-minded i don't necessarily agree with you but that's fine you just like want to talk about the midi like where where does he come from and how did he end up that, yeah, yeah, has, yeah, that, has this guy has he responded that would be super interesting to see their thinking because i think just hearing them talking about what's happening in the effects like you know like you have some form of feedback loop, a couple of delays, whatever, saturation, whatever is going on. Right? And it's like, okay, can I do, even if it's not exactly that, can I do something like that? And you can in Ableton to a degree, you know, like you can sort of make your own version of glitch machines. So anyone who's watching, go and check them out. Like, yeah. look, look at their YouTube videos and think about like, ah, oh, how can I, how can I achieve this in, in Ableton? And actually that's a technique that I, when I, when I started my modular journey, on that point, actually, people say like, oh, you know, like gear is not going to make you a better musician. Maybe not, but I think sometimes a piece of equipment makes you do things in a way that you wouldn't have done it otherwise. And for me, modular was definitely that. And when I started using my modular synthesizer, that really changed how I thought about Ableton as well. And I think a lot of the stuff that I do in Ableton now is like almost with a sort of a modular hat on thinking about like using modulation and that sort of thing to affect parameters. And I hadn't thought about it in that way anyway. And I think that helped when I started making these sort of glitch machines. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely very similar, like sort of spending a lot of time in modular coming from um, doing things in Ableton and Max MSP and in Reason, um, and then just thinking, right now is the time. I've just, I've just got to get, I've just got to get into modular, and then getting a little bit bored of it, and then coming back to Ableton and coming back to Max MSP with this sort of refreshed, um, like brain and approach of like, I, I actually understand loads more now about things that I never thought I would particularly to do with things like logic as in like you know lo logic gates boolean logic yeah, yeah. and um and like wave shaping and um you know ways interesting ways to use sample and hold and all that sort of stuff that um you know i just i i, I had a certain outlook at it at one point spend a little bit of time with modular it all kind of gets reconfigured come back and then and so there's kind of like this sort of dance between the two <laughs> and like yeah it really just this it just it it's always expanding your brain and expanding the the ways that you can approach things i i think it started off like i saw people doing things using modular synths on youtube and there were amazing sounds coming out of it i had no idea how it worked and then Schneider's Laden had set up, the German company had set up like a showroom at Rough Trade in London where you could just go and have a go. And they had a whole wall. Did you ever go there to that? I didn't know, but so and, that, that's the that, that's the big shop in Berlin, isn't it? Schneider's. Uh, Schneider, yeah, yeah. They, that's the sort of, yeah, I've never been there. But they had set up a, a sort of a corner in Rough Trade just off Brick Lane. 
uh, in the record shop that was a sort of a modular synth room and you could buy stuff there but also they had this wall and you could try things and they had a live camera feed and the phone in there so there was like a hotline straight to berlin so if you were in there <laughs> really? just like speak that. i'd never did and, and sometimes like I, I can't remember but let's say every tuesday or whatever there would be someone in there you could chat to and they would show you and went in there and this guy was in there and he he knew what he was talking about but he was not necessarily the greatest communicator and he quickly just disappeared into his own zone and he's like i was like I've, i'm lost now i have no idea what's going on and then every like new year's eve i would or like over christmas i would go back to sweden and over new year's eve i would stay at my friend's place and i would use my friend's bed studio as my bedroom and he had like loads of modular gear and over a few years like he sort of showed me and i sort of just got you know started doing a go and then i think was it uh what are they called the people who do complete um native instruments do, yeah yeah contact no not contact what's the reactor that's reactor yeah, yeah 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 and they did a version where they had like it's it's in reactor isn't it like where they did that sort of module oh the blocks reactor blocks yeah yeah exactly yeah so i um i i did not download a dodgy copy of that just go and i thought like I'm, I'm going to i'm going to give it a go and see like if i can understand what it is and then there was a, uh, an online shop where they had you could buy something interest free over a two year period and i thought like and the guy who taught started teaching me had a bunch of modules he was not using and it's like you can borrow these buy your first and then you sort of, then i was sort of on my way and the thing is like with it looks way more complicated than it is i think the sort of logic underneath it all it's not that much you have to understand to get going but unless you know those things it is it is tricky uh, but one thing that i have quite managed to penetrate i think the things that i've managed to do have been superficial and that's the max msp stuff i mean this very and then i used to be a computer programmer but max msp has just been i find it really hard like what was how did you manage to i've done simple things in it but how did you get into that how did you manage to start doing stuff uh well it, oh, well i i don't really know i think i mean the it was it was really propeller heads reason that was the first program that where i sort of really understood what an lfo does and what you can do with it mm -hmm. and um how you can use it to control other things and so in terms of like modulating things and and um you know doing like non-linear processes to sound that was really where i sort of got the hang of it and then when i sort of maybe got a little bit uh, better of an understanding i had a go at reactor um but it, i didn't really take to it and then when of course um ableton acquired cycling 74 and introduced max for live i was like well i guess, I guess now's the time to get into it and so you know with an understanding of things like okay i know what a sine wave is and i know what a like a sample and hold lfo is what can i do with those things and the first thing i did was is that i just tried to i was i was mad into like plugins like glitch 2 and like uh, artillery and all those sort of like 2000s um sort of buffer override and all that sort of stuff like stuff that was like sampling audio in real time and screwing around with it i was like well i like that i want to get into that so it was really just a case of what do i need so it was a, it was a mixed bag of like asking people on the internet and just using the 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 max reference file ecosystem to just try and find i i found reactor a little bit tricky in that sense um like, i never built anything in reactor i was more like blocks with the ready-made modules i never but I, I think with Max MSP, I, I, maybe it's just I haven't been patient enough, but I think it's those things where like, how on earth did I know that I was meant to search for the borax or whatever it's called? You know, like it's just not called yeah. stuff that I know what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they, they definitely they, they definitely do have like little, um, there, are, there are other things like the buddy object. And, yeah. um, you know, there, there are certainly things in there that have like little kind of 
wink wink in joke names yeah. and you're never really gonna know what they're for <laughs> but like you know if you it, you know if if you know that you need like a multiplier to make something loud and quiet then you know you can just type in the multiply just type the just type the, the multiply button like on the keyboard and mm. then you've got a multiplier so but there, there were some things where i was just kind of like i yeah i clearly don't know what i thought i knew so i'm gonna have to ask people um and the max the max community is very friendly and it's it's always been quite easy but it, yeah like if you can if you can kind of um navigate the the help file system then it can really it can help quite a lot i said the, the name the, the clues in the name like any object like you can alt click the object and it opens the help file system which gives you an interactive demonstration patch that you can copy into your patch um to just explain what it is some of it's a little dated needs updating but most of it's all just pretty standard it's all interchangeable techniques you know like if you want to learn how to do fm synthesis the principles are the same they're not going to change you know did you did you know like i, I think the things that i have managed to make which are quite simple things but they i think they stemmed from a need that i didn't have anything else that fulfilled that need and therefore i just like i'm going to go and build it and when I've been trying to learn other things in Max MSP, it's like, it's not that I need another FM synth, but I start here somewhere and then maybe my patience just sort of wears off. So maybe I just need to find some needs that I need to sort of, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I would absolutely uh, agree that that's a good starting point. Like, so w when I first started getting into it, I thought, I thought to myself, if I'm going to learn this, I'm going to need to set myself a goal. So my first goal was, is that I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a delay, but I'm going to put a filter in the feedback loop so I can make mm -hmm. a, a kind of old school dub echo type delay or whatever. And so I, I did a little bit of online research and looked at some of the examples and kind of thought, all right, well, I clearly need these objects to, you know, tap in, tap out to create a delay line. And then I need to use these objects, the state variable filter or low pass or one pole or whatever, to create some filtering in the feedback loop. And um, and then I need to learn how to make them uh, sync to Ableton's uh, transport. So I need to understand the timing syntax that there is in, in Max MSP and all that sort of stuff. So, and actually it was kind of quite quick. Um, but I was quite determined, um, but but I was determined because I'd, I'd set that goal on myself. Yeah. It was like, I'm, I'm, I, I need to make this, as you say, having a need to do it. Therefore, I need to understand all of these things that I need to, to achieve that. And once you've, once you've focused in on that, the research becomes much, much easier. If you don't have any yeah. ideas, then it's just kind of like, oh, what it's am like I It's like learning make? a language without actually needing to use it. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, like it's speaking. like, you know, it, exactly, yeah. But I did, the first thing I ever did, I, there's a couple of things, to, this is years ago, and what I, what I did in it was very simple, but we were in an office at the time, I was a computer programmer, and there was a MIDI drum kit in the office, like one of those, I don't know, Roland something, whatever. And we had been discussing, like, by playing guitar, guitar hero, you don't actually become a good guitarist. You know, like, there's nothing about playing yeah, I know. I, I don't know. I, I, that's it. I've never thought about that. But, but no, but, but we were thinking, and then we were comparing it to like wax on, wax off in, uh, in the Karate Kid. Yeah, where you know, like he does something and doesn't realize he's learning another skill. Yeah, yeah, and he's so building up like, his upper body strength. Yeah, but just and imagine his... that you have this drum kit, and we make a karate game but you play it with the drum kit, like actual, and the rhythm of the enemies and everything, like you have, you actually become a good at drumming by playing this fighting game. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what you're we're gonna do. The, um, you're learning the rudiments, I think. That's yeah, what so, so you could do, and, and then we just got, got, went overboard and it's just like, okay, so imagine like we do a fighting game. So one person plays the drums and the other person plays the guitar and you can choose to play nicely together or you can play to win. So you have like, you know, like, so you do different sort of kicks and stuff like by playing the drums. So we, we never finished it. And then I did, which actually there is a YouTube video, not on the fellow passenger, I can send you the link, 
it's called Gearbox, where I, that was also like, I suppose because there was an end goal, this never materialized. There was going to be this electronic music festival in Sweden, and there was going to be this sort of foyer where people could just like hang out when they were not sort of seeing anyone play live or whatever, like sort of like a chill out area. Uh, it started off with an idea and they said, like, oh yeah, can we do that in there? It's going to be these boxes where you could play chess and depending on how you played, the music would change. Like, so you move the chess pieces around and that there would be, uh, um, then again, like, do you want to play chess to make it sound nice or do you want to play to win? And, you know, like, so the music in the room would change. So I started building this yeah. prototype and my ambition was like, I think I bought a dirt cheap webcam. It was like 10 quid and I had a cardboard box, whatever. And then I used, um, I could probably have done it just in Max MSP if I knew how to, but I programmed something in open frameworks that then talked to Max MSP, who then talked to Ableton. So there was a, a webcam sitting inside this box and it was sort of semi-transparent and you could, you didn't need to use chess pieces. You could have used anything on there, but depending on where you placed things on this box, you could sort of, change things so it became almost like a dirt cheap diy midi controller or something so was the camera like looking at what was the camera doing then was it looking so, yeah so that, like actually i can is it possible to play i mean it's a super short youtube video can i play yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. can i yeah, play yeah, yeah. it here does that work yeah yeah if you do share sound it should work okay so i'll i'll bear with me i'll just need to figure it out share is that working I see it. Okay. I'm guessing that car that went past is not in the video. Okay. <laughs> so th that was basically like the, the inside the box. I think you show it later. There's like a step seat. Uh, there's the web camera sits inside that cardboard box looking up. So it's basically detecting the shadows of wherever you place anything. Also use it like yeah. come on. It's basically just able to running in the background. the camera with the laser pointer. And the webcam doesn't know what to do and then you just get some glitches. <laughs> anyway, super nerdy again. No, interesting, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what did you what did you um, use to write that uh, piece of software then? Uh, open Frameworks, which is an open oh. source like programming thing, which is intended for, oops, What happened? Are you still there? I'm still here. Yeah. I can still hear you. There. Over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Fine. Yes. So I used Open Frameworks, which is intended for, I suppose, artists who want to do visual stuff, but you know, it's got like coding libraries and things. It's using, uh, is it C++? I can't even remember anymore what it is. I think so. Like, yeah, but they, they, they've made lots of libraries to make it very easy. They've like prepackaged a lot of the code so you don't have to write the sort of low level stuff. So it's got all these things for doing stuff with microphones and cameras and doing that gubbins. So, right, but there right. was Max MSP was sort of sitting in between just to be able to communicate with Ableton. I think I could probably have done it either just in Max MSP in one way or another, or I could have done it just in, um, just in open frameworks if I would have been good enough. But that led to another idea, which I still think is interesting, but I'm just not a good enough programmer, I think. But 
you know you have x and y pads so that's like up and down and left and right like that's it but imagine that you would use a qr code instead like on a beer mat and the camera could see all three axes you're moving it so you can with one hand that you can actually change three parameters rather than just two but then you've got two hands so you can maybe change six parameters so if you have a, a beer mat with a qr code printed on it and you hold it in front of the camera I don't know if this would work, but imagine that you would print beer mats and you would have it for your audience and there would be a camera and the audience could pick beer mats up and sort of change the, some of the parameters and you would pick ones that would be fun for the audience to control. But you could sort of yeah. use similar technique. How so, uh, Are you talking about like there being like some depth perception? Exactly. So there being the, like an X, Y X, y, yeah, yeah, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, so, de yeah, de de depending on how you moved it, so the camera would pick it up. I don't know if you, how many would be able to cope with it at any one time, but imagine that you would just like, because the beer mat is something you can then have your audience interact with your music, but you're actually not giving them an expensive piece of kit. You just like got a piece of printed card. Yeah, that they can, they can throw up. it away. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. I saw, I was at the hack space many years ago and Tim, what's his name? He's released something on Warp, I think. Tim. Tim Exile? Yes, thank you. He was there and he was building something for, uh, I think it was a piece of Perspex that just would change color through some LEDs by picking up sound or whatever. But basically there was a place in the room where there was a microphone where people could just go and add things to his music, you know? Um, I suppose for people who haven't looked at Tim Exile stuff, uh, go and check it out. I think he does quite a lot of sort of live looping and things like that, doesn't he? And like takes sounds and just like twists. Yeah, yeah. Live. So uh, I, I actually did a gig with Tim Exile. Um, did you? Wow. Yeah, way way back in I think uh, 2006, I think. And he was, um, yeah, he would just it, it all just happened straight away. <laughs> he would just he would just go into the mic and then suddenly it was turning into jungle you know it was all <laughs> yeah. super fast and uh, you know and it can go in any direction um and now he does endless of course so yes which i actually funded but realized i haven't forgotten about it so i've never really used it uh yeah well i i got the um i think it's free now um I, I I got the I, when it came out I got the iPhone version and I thought it was really fun and I was on it a lot and now they've I can't remember actually maybe it was maybe a year ago they put out a free desktop version um, oh. which I've not yet explored but um, yeah it's very much in that kind of uh, it, it it all happens very quickly it's all very instantaneous and it's and it's um, it's all very sort of accessible and sounds good it's uh it's really great yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But that Team Exile, you know, that method of doing, I don't know, have you, you probably come across Beardy Man as well, who's like yeah, 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 yeah. drum and bass stuff, that I'm thinking when you do generative music in general, that you come up with a few things, that you almost create a framework that whatever you generate at random will not just result in chaos. It will just, you somehow create boundaries to make it like you sort of harness it in a way like yeah i that that's like something that's absolutely been at the back of my mind for for some time for, for a live performance but in terms of it being a live performance that i can get really that i can really get into like i'm not i'm not about to get up and do um any kind of sophisticated live looping whether it's beatboxing or playing the guitar or or whatever like i i've tried the live looping thing just personally and i i can't do it it's it's too nerve-wracking like it really requires a certain amount of um i think skill and confidence to be able to just go press a button do a thing release the button and be certain that it's going to be good because if it's not then it's really bad yeah. <laughs> right so but like the, this idea of like having something, some sort of system happening in the background that's just churning out these ideas that I can kind of poke into and get two, maybe four bars out of and run with for, for, for an indefinite amount of time and maybe mangle that up a bit. 
Um, it's something that's really, really interesting to me. Um, I, I sort of got quite close to it with the Eurorack and the Octatrack, where I was clocking the uh, the Eurorack from the Octatrack using a Expert Sleeper's MIDI breakout. And I sort of patched the Eurorack to, to just kind of do beats and textures and stuff, but they were changing a lot whether it was the textures or the rhythms or whatever, but there, there were there were clearly defined moments in what it was doing. There's a kick where it needs to be. There's a snare where it wants to be. Everything else is just, you know, whatever, uh, arbitrary as it were. But then I, at, at any point I could hit a button on the Octatrack and just receive two bars worth of stuff and start looping it. And if it sounds good, I'll keep going with it. And if it sounds bad, I'll trash it and move on to the next thing. And that's kind of like the closest I've got to doing it in hardware. Um, but I've was it always like... going to sound, it was never going to sound so bad that it would be a showstopper? Was it like, it was, you could get rid of it and just move on to something else, but it, or, or could it be? There, 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 there maybe might be a way that I could kind of like, um, yeah, kind of audition it uh in real time and be able to decide no that's that's crap i need something else you know so but, or, or, or or that even if you sort of literally just go with the flow and play it out live it's it's going to be palatable even though it's not the most exciting thing and then you can choose to move on or could it be complete chaos like how chaotic could it get is there some structure to it so it will always be something yeah i think probably it in in hardware it might be quite difficult i'm very very close to buying the electron analog rhythm exactly for this reason because i think i think that that is going to be able to outside of software and eurorack that is the closest thing that's going to be able to maybe give me this sort of idea that i have of like i can leave that thing prattling away in the background and then at any point i can dip into it and see what it's doing and go okay i'll take those two bars thanks that i've that i've looped onto something else mm. but to be able to have like a little bit of control, like macroed control. So sort of like, okay, I'm going to dial back the um, the intensity. I'm going to dial back the probability, um, something like that. Um, where like if I, if I want something that's not too chaotic and a bit sparse, I can just turn it down. <laughs> and what it's going to do is something that is what I'm expecting that I can then grab and then turn into and and then see where that goes and maybe layer other things on top or something. It's kind of it's it's been like a an ongoing thing that I've been trying to realize. I know that I could probably do it in Max MSP. It's I know it's just going to be a lot of work. I know I could probably do it in Ableton, but I think it would be a little bit um in terms of the amount of options that I have like say I don't know thousands of kick drum samples. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit much for to get an Ableton set to deal with, to just keep spitting out sounds constantly for me to then just grab like a bar or two bars. So it's 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 not been a fruitless endeavor, but I am still kind of like, I still haven't settled on. And, and again, it, it is kind of linked in with that sort of uh, like live looping thing of, um, you know, what uh, what's what's happening now? What, what have I got now? Um, kind of like a ready, steady rave. <laughs> type thing or something it, it 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 really will only work in certain contexts as well so it might work in a in a kind of arty listening rave type live performance i don't think it would work too well <clears throat> i don't know it might work in a techno in a techno capacity i think it could quite work if you've got a good solid kick drum or something but um it's definitely been an ongoing thing in the back of my mind of how can i do a live performance that feels unique each time that i do it but is stable and accessible enough that it's not too chaotic but it's using some of the chaos that random and gener generative mm. stuff can give you you know so would you say that that's the the bigger thing that you are working on at the moment it's like that the thing that you're sort of exploring or is it just like one of loads of them for 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 performances um i've, I've kind of got like two aspirations when it comes to doing performances one is to just do a good dj set and one is to do something that is really improvised but safe and you know i i before the pandemic all i was doing was euro rack shows and whilst it was good um because it was kind of trendy at the time 
um, it was good to be getting all of these shows. I was taking a, a Eurorack system around, patching it the night before, closing the lid, putting it in the car, getting to the gear, opening the lid, doing a sound check, and just going, I can't remember anything. I Like, I don't know what I've done. And also, everything's completely fucked, because in the car, one att attenuator has nudged a millimetre and thrown the whole thing out of out of skew or whatever and they were awful and i was i was re recording these shows listening to them on the way home and just thinking i can't believe that 20 people have just listened to this <laughs> it's <just> like terrible <laughs> I, I think it would be f I, I i hardly done any form i did back in sweden but that's just so long ago now like doing some live stuff it would be fun to do but i just don't think i know enough people or the right people to find like a forum for it i don't know I will do one day. I'll sort it out. Where, where, uh, so, um, where are you living now? Aberystwyth, did you say? No, I live in Britain's smallest town called Manningtree. It's, it's, I mean, it's 50 minutes from London. It's in between Colchester and... Why does I think Aberystwyth? I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry, I think I might be... It's, I think it's, I, uh, yeah, my so, email's so, mixed up. So, so I'm <clears> just <throat> on the... Uh, yeah, so I'm in Essex, but on the Suffolk borders. But it's close to getting to London, you know. Well, there's loads. I mean, I can think of loads of things in London that are pretty modular. Oh, yeah. I bet, I bet, I bet, I bet, I bet rehearse some stuff first. I think. Well, yeah. But no, I, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I, I know Chelsea, who does CV freaks. She's wanting to do something again in London. She's put an application in to do something at the Barbican. Oh wow! Um, oh well, and, I, have I met her? Yeah, I've been to CV freaks a few times. I suppose I could have done it there, but I never, never actually brought my. I just went there to sort of look at other people's stuff yeah 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 sure i mean there's there's definitely a really big community of people in london who are into that sort of stuff yeah um, should probably just make more of an effort i suppose yeah i mean like i it, to be quite honest i don't really even know how i managed to get any gigs euro rack gigs and i think like i say i think it was just because it was a bit trendy at the time yeah yeah this was sort of like between 2016 and 2019 it seemed that every gig that i was at least getting offered was off the the back of the fact that i started posting modular videos and i just kind of thought well people like this stuff so actually maybe it doesn't even really matter what i do because everyone's so curious it just yeah about, it just looks good <laughs> it looks good and everyone's so curious about this sort of pseudo sentient kind of mm. weird alien sound instrument that's coming out that like people are just like what is it they don't understand it but i would come away thinking <clears throat> what i just played was absolute nonsense like it was awful and so i've come away from that thinking that um i i it, it's nice it's nice to be given the opportunity to have a space to explore things on my own terms but i really need to come away from it feeling like that i that I did something that I like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that you felt proud of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I would also just being super selfish and just interested to hear something that I've done on a sound system on a, at a different scale, you know, and also just see how people react to anything I do. Because like when you sit at home and you're just like nerding away, making this stuff, you know, just I used to play this loads of records behind there like used to dj a bit that was more in sweden as well like seeing the reaction from the crowd and allowing you to sort of take it in a direction depending on what you see create certain reactions to stuff yeah it's it's tricky to do that with uh euro rack <laughs> yes but i i i i think there's a lot of it doesn't need to be Eurac. I mean, it could be Ableton and stuff. I don't know. I think it's like what you were saying, like creating that framework of what do you have control over and how you set the parameters on how chaotic something can get. And then maybe you can have uh, ways of like, okay, we need a break now. We need like, and you can you don't necessarily know exactly how that break is going to be, but you know, you need a break or you need something calmer. I don't know. I, yeah. One of the big things that is, I should just start doing it rather than just thinking about it is using generative thinking, but not only because at the moment, a lot of the stuff that I do creates lots of elements of a track and it can be quite pleasant to listen to 
loop that is sort of ever changing. But one thing that I haven't sort of generated is an interesting song structure that it actually creates almost like a dramaturgical curve, you know, like that you just have diff different sections of the song with a beginning and middle and an end and breaks and like those sort of things that you use a generative approach to just like, so if I could build my own monkey drum thing where you press <laughs> a button, so it like picks a tempo, it, uh, you know, like it generates the breaks, it's say like, okay, now we're going to have so many bars of this, but you sort of set up parameters. So it's always going to be something that works, but it's generated and it just like something that generates like more of a song rather than just something that is sort of just goes on and on and on. It just creates a, I don't know if, I'm, I'm sure it would be possible in one way or another. I'm not quite sure how to make it. The other I thing of, that- I can think yeah, of a couple of ways to do that in Ableton, just using lots of samples in samplers and just switching between them in various ways. Yeah, I think some simple, I, I've, I've made something, uh, I've made a video or two and I use it quite a lot, which I, I call it like an event handler. And it's something where you can set, set up, like make a change after eight bars, but like build on that and do something like pick a new, yeah. A bit like we talked about the using the racks and having a sort of a, um, not an LFO that sort of, I'm not making sense now at all, but it sort of jumps to a, a different part, like going, yeah, like using um, instrument racks and, and, and effects racks to just to create different sections and it sort of jumps to, a, to another section and then generates like the ambient bit or whatever it needs to be. I don't know. Yeah, this is something that I've tried a, a couple of times in, particularly with beats. Um, you know, it's kind of like it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a toss up between developing a, a drum engine that can randomize within the confines of what you'd expect from a drum engine, hmm. a steep pitch modulation, the right amount of release and all that sort of stuff, or just creating a sampler with an enormous database of drum samples. And that's kind of one of the nice things about Max MSP, like in Ableton, you're kind of, you're always going to be limited to like having 128 things. Um, you know, you, you can stack them up and create banks, but like, you're never going to be able to create a, a sampler where you can load 10,000 samples into it. But you can do that in Maximus P. You, you, oh. you, if, you've, if you've got a folder with 10,000 kick drum just samples, points in that it, folder, you just it? tell Max to look at that folder and at any point it'll index the folder. It'll tell you how many samples are there. You calculate your, or, or you, you retrieve, you query how many um, samples are in there and then you tell Max to just randomly scale between zero and that number. And then at any point you tell it, give me a new kick drum and it will do it. And, um, you know, it's kind of things like that that just kind of make me go, oh yeah, like imagine just having the fruit, the, the, a kind of fruit machine meets drum machine, you know, like the one arm bandit where you kind of go, when it goes yeah. <laughs> and gives you some fruit, like it's that, but like a drum machine. And, um, you know, it's just, it's things like that. that I'm just, I'm looking at the technology and I'm thinking it can do it. And I kind of want it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think the the other thing that I'm really curious about, which doesn't happen so much in electronic music, and this was an idea. There is a, in South West London, there is a, is it called the Musical Museum? And they have all these Victorian music machines there. It's really weird and amazing. So they have like these, enormous machines with sort of built-in drums and violins and everything and it's like automated and they have those do you know the pianola which has the piano rolls in like a piano self-playing piano uh is that with the is it like with the paper There's yes the holes in the paper yeah that's yeah, right yeah. yeah so the guy the i did a guided tour and the guide he's like okay, i'm going to show you how this works and he said like most people who had these at home they would just like pedal away and it was just like going to play it but he said like the if you are a talented pianola player like then the, the thing that there is something you control with your knee which is the velocity i think and then you set the tempo with your feet but you create tension and release in the music by tempo changes and this sort of made me think and he was sort of playing sort of rachmaninov or something you know like and how much 
tempo changes can actually do. I fully understand that if you're DJing, that's not something you would want. But if you're not DJing and trying to beat mix, I think it would be interesting to explore tension and release through tempo changes uh, um, in electronic music because you can automate the tempo in Ableton. And like, if I could come up with a way of just exploring that a bit more and see if that I, as you were saying that, I was thinking there is a term for it. So I Googled it and what's come up is accelerando, gradually speeding up. Ah. Alagando, growing broader or decreasing in tempo. And calando, going slower. So, and I'm guessing these are, you know, historical terms for mm. tempo changes. I mean, it's, it's in the Star Wars theme. If you listen to the Star Wars theme. Yeah. It slows down a bit and then does the reprise or whatever. The, the, I mean, there's lots it, in classical music. I think it's like it's used like loads, like Claire de Lune, like has that like and it sort of like creates this momentum and then it sort of stops. And I'm just wondering if I would like just to try it because it's something I haven't really tried much to use tempo change as a creative tool to create tension and release. Or maybe like a cyclical tempo change. Where it's kind of it's changing tempo over the course of the bar. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, kind of so it's like trying to start a car or something. It's yeah, just yeah, like... yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Those are kinds of those are those are. I th I think like there's there's an Orteca track somewhere. I think it might be on LP five or something or LP seven. I can't remember the name. Where the beat kind of goes. Yes, if anyone would have done it, they would definitely it kind of like have, sort yeah. of slows down over the course of one bar and then go speeds back up again yes so, so, you know there's all the, there's all these kind of things that yeah you sort of um they, they're, they're so sort of simple um in in their idea but to actually execute them is that quite challenging <laughs> but i also think the brain like that even if you do things like that but as long as you start repeating it rather than just having it entirely random like if yeah, you just you do it enough, your brain will just accept it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. And that's like that's kind of what's that's what's fun about, you know, going back to the thing I was saying earlier about like, you know, there might be some chaos happening somewhere else in the in the setup, but the minute that you grab a bit of it and start looping it, it starts to become music. And it might be good. Uh, if it's crap, it's okay. You just go with it for a bit and then you trash it and see what the next what the next thing comes mm. along. Whilst we're sort of on the subject of having a tool uh, uh, that's spitting out generative ideas that we can kind of like grab and appropriate in the moment as and when we need to, I was thinking of uh, something that maybe I could show you that maybe you might quite like. Um, of like sort of generating musical phrases um, that would, i mean the thing that i find dif most difficult is the things that are non-percussive so if there are musical phrases that sounds inspiring well like this is this was something i sort of like once i kind of got um chewed into this um expression control thing yes i was I a little bit that. like well I'm not really going to need anything else, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, that, I, I totally over... The thing is, I didn't. Re I don't know if I didn't realise or if it didn't have that functionality originally. So that was one of the things that I hacked it. Like, I just wanted the random function, and that's what I use all the time. I just take that, set all of them to random, and just, like, apply that to everything. Yeah, completely. And, like, you know, you don't need one. You can you can have as many as you want and you can just you can keep going but and like, then you map you also take you have two and then you map one of them to the rise and fall on the other and then you just like <laughs> yeah 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 i never even thought about that yeah the the i i really neglected the rise and fall thing for a long time but i've started playing around with that a lot more now and um, yeah and try yeah try that use you, you can't map it to its own rise and fall you have to have two yeah okay interesting so I could go like map to that. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, 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 gotcha, yeah, yeah. So um, this one thing that I've sort of been playing around with is like, you know, using the arpeggiator in conjunction with the note length, and then you choose um, 
you choose a scale. Let's just use the Dorian mode. Um, I actually have this little problem where I have to do this each time I load this thing <laughs> because I'm not 100% convinced yet. Okay, so, and then I need some sort of instrument. So um, I'll just use like operator um, with a saw or something. I love oh, just on, rand on. randomizing the wave with operator using the... Uh... Yeah, randomizing the... Can you hear that? Yeah, it's working. So, like, the first thing that I think of is, like, being able to randomize the note length. So even though that I've kind of, I've drawn in a, um, you know, a note here, but mm. the length of this note doesn't matter at all because it's going to be determined by the, the note length plugin. So... So maybe that's going a little bit too fast. So I'll just, or rather for too long. So I'll just adjust the minimum maximum. That's still too fast. Let's come down a little bit. So sometimes it will. Is that actually doing that? I just get one note now. Uh... Maybe I need to tune this. Yeah. So sometimes it's. It so still does it. It only does a sixteenth. Oh, but I suppose when it's longer, you just get more sixteenth notes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, it's basically dynamically changing the length of the MIDI note. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Yeah. And then, um, you know, once you've chosen your um, your scale, um, where I like to go from there is I might maybe. Pull in the random before the arpeggiator and then um, a chord after the random before the arpeggiator. It doesn't matter what interval this is because it's all going to get randomized by the random. And then it should, in theory, create a kind of random chord that the arpeggiator can then respond to. So you get this sort of this sort of phrasing. Ah, oh, yeah. I, I, I got ideas. Let's take, go on. Yeah, you finish. So, and then I would take like another random on here and map it to the style of the arpeggiator. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, go on. Oh no, no, you finish first because you may be doing this. Yeah, go no, on. No, no, I was I, well, I, 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 just because you mentioned it earlier. Then you could take a random and map that random to the waveform of the operator. See what that does. <laughs> this, this. Oh, no, no, no. You need to. You need to take. You need to remove that. To remove that random that you just did. And then you add another expression control that sits after the arpeggiator. And then you take that random. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not going to be chaotic enough. <laughs> OK. And then, uh, then you, I was thinking, like, after the after the before the scale you if you have you make it uh, an effect track or a midi effect track with the chord and then you do a few different layers with different inversions of different chords and one which doesn't necessarily have a chord at all so sometimes you get chords mix into it that would work wouldn't it uh so yeah if i think i think i understand what you've meant so if i took like that yes and then if you, I took something and then you like take... this and, and then, then you... i made a chain yeah. with nothing in it and then a second chain with a chord in it which has you know some 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 chord and then you have make another chain with a different either an inversion or a different chord and then a third one with some other whatever and then you open the chain selector. I was going to go for velocity. 
Oh, okay. I was just going to use another. Gonna... Ra- I was just going to use another random. But you can do velocity. Yeah, no, I was going to. I was thinking. So I'm always thinking velocity. So then I'll pull in the velocity plugin, which is going to randomize the velocity and switch between the different chains. Let's see if this works. Oh, you should. Can, can you use from the expression plugin if you if you randomize the decay of the notes, so you sometimes get sort of longer ones that feel longer. Let me see. So let's pull the sustain down. Yes. Oh, the, the release. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try that. It gets quite hard to navigate when you're, I find I, I'm doing a lot of holding shift and scrolling. Okay. <laughs> see, I think like some of them, I think I don't want the chords all the time, so I'll sort no, of... No, there's probably, they should time. be, they should be more rare, yes. Oh, did I do that right? There we go. Yeah, and then we'll put this one here like this. Oh, do you still have your feedback chain on return channel A? I don't, but I can very quickly make a new one. <laughs> yes, I was just thinking because then you can randomize the, the send to it. So that chords like sometimes just like throw it sit into your crazy feedback chain. Yeah. Actually, I could even um, randomize the arpeggiator. Right. So you get these kinds of things, and then the more that you sort of introduce more MIDI notes um, with some other interval, oh, yeah, yeah. or just or just a different level of chance. And like, yes, and then to back to what we were saying earlier, and then if you just now, if if you just like capture a bit of that and start looping it, it will start making sort of sense in your brain, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm. I've changed my mind about modulating the uh, arpeggiator rate. I'll just keep it at sixteenth. But so it's just uh, I don't. I don't know what it's going to do. Just do. Just throw some effects in the return channel. It doesn't matter what it is if it's a reverb or something, but something that. Or it could be a vocoder or something. This just adds a bit of tail so you get boom. And then you randomize the send. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. With this one or this one? Uh, maybe the first one because then it will be less often. I'll, I'll, I'll randomize the uh, return. The uh, feed, the feedback as well. Oh yeah, good idea. <laughs> I'm really into this dynamic tube on the reverb at the moment. I have not tried that, so it really, really grunges up the reverb. I still think it's sometimes playing phrases that are too long. It's all about finding the sweet spots. I think that that the the, the min and max thing, so you can sort of dial it in, so you don't get certain extremes. <laughs> so really, like, where I'm going with this is that. It's a way to create space between all the randomness. Mm. So rather than it just being a constant stream of notes, you introduce these little pauses, these little breathing points, which gives it a sense of phrasing. And every once in a while, it might do something that, you know, might come out kind of quite nice. It's just got a, it's just got a humanness about it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, this is this is a really good idea. I I did a. I I I was using a lot of the. The sequencers, the sort of Max for Live, sequencers. And but then you get that problem where like. It's just very rigid, isn't it? Like you know, like you have, eight notes or sixteen notes or whatever. Like, but they always like. So I. 
modified them in Max for Live, and so they wouldn't just on every beat, they wouldn't move one step forward. They would require a MIDI note to come in, so you could sort of set a bit of rhythm. But I think this this takes that to a different place. Mm, okay. I mean, I, I didn't do a particularly refined demonstration just then, but like no, no, no. But it's the idea, 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 idea is is the modulating the note length into an arpeggiator is going to give you, you know, just a bit of space. Yeah. Between the flurries of notes. Mm. I've got you I've got you thinking, haven't I? I've got you thinking. Yes. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to if you allow me to, because that may before be may have been before you click record, Ned Rush sent me a bunch of samples with beats. And maybe I could do a challenge when I do one of my sort of practice sessions and put it up as a video that I this, that can be my only sound source material. Would that yeah. be okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah and, yeah. and and yeah, I'll I'll credit you for it. But yeah, that's going to be my challenge. And then maybe try a bit of this. Maybe uh, yeah, okay. So if that's going to be the only material, that needs that's going to be the source for any melodic stuff as well. Then your beats. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, get some of those beats, shrink them down to a tiny little loop. Yeah. Tune tune it. So we're down to like not even a millisecond, just like a few cycles of a, of one part of the yeah. waveform. And could I then also turn one of the beats like translated into MIDI, so that becomes the melody? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do and convert, then, uh, do um, slice, slice to MIDI. Yeah, yeah, and then put some form of scale to it, um, or or maybe. Maybe I'm not allowed to do that. Maybe I'll just have to do what I'm given. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so uh, well. I I mean, I don't know. I so are you suggesting that I impose the constraints on you? Is I didn't what... think of that, but you can. Yeah, go for it. I can say like, okay, I was, I, I'm I, I'm Ned Rush's slave. <laughs> you have to tell well, me. <laughs> you you could you could you could take one of those drum breaks that I sent you and make uh, an entire track just from just from the sample. Yeah. I've done that a couple of times. By just yep. kind of like you take so, so the, the, the you can make any sound out of any sound really yeah exactly yeah. so I would just kind of loop a tiny bit down on a down to a granular level and then tune it so it's like in tune and then um, use that as like a a wave really, yeah an oscillator I, I I did I I one of my videos is like I was only allowed to use sounds from hamburger a, is it AMSR is that what it's called like when you have the people who sort of it, 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 I'm familiar with it yeah it's a very sort of diverse phenomenon I've watched yeah, all kinds and, of and ASMR is, stuff there, there is there is a genre where people eat burgers so I was only allowed to use that as my sound source <laughs> or I've seen, used... like, I've, I've seen some weird ASMR stuff like I, I some of it is really really good like I've, I've seen like ASMR washing machines ASMR hard drives, like 10 hours of hard drives whirring on YouTube to help people get off to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's like I watched one guy, he had like for 10 hours, like you, because 10 hours on YouTube is a, is a trend as well. There's 10 hours of everything on YouTube. But there's one guy, he had these two, like two, he's taking it quite seriously, bought proper microphones and he's just picking up things and just going like, you probably can't hear that. Just doing this, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. For like, 10 is it hours. is it a ten hour not looping thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like literally ten hours. I maybe it's been edited. I don't know. But I think the idea is is that it, it's. I I appreciate that it's. I mean, you know, you look at the comments, and there are people who are in there are like, "This has helped me with my PTSD. This has helped me with. Uh, I'm I'm an ex uh, army veteran. This helps me get off to sleep." And you just kind of think. You can't really look down the nose at this. There's obviously something happening there somewhere. But the, <laughs> but, but the, the, the lengths that people go to in order to sort of explore that is kind of interesting. Like I've seen like videos of people like slicing stuff, mm. <laughs> like slicing cheese. <laughs> and it's but what, of... do they, what do they use? Like I don't know what microphones they would use. They, or do they have some sort of much no noise? Must be very like condenser microphones and a good preamp with the gain up really loud mm. must be <laughs> i 
I, I know that the V&A, the museum, have done their own ASMR channel with their collection. So you can sort of look at them opening drawers with art in and stuff like that. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I, I think the Science Museum, we're going to latch on to that too. I don't think it actually materialized. Actually, on the Science Museum note, this is... So the museum has got about 8% of its entire collection on display. The rest is in storage. And we were going to the store room. I was going there with one of the curators because we were going to look at something. And she is the curator of like radios and stuff. And this was like, so we go into this warehouse and there are these sort of Tolex boxes saying Roland on them. And it's just like, what's, 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 what's happening over there? And she's like, oh, I don't know where it is. Like, can, I said, can we go and look? And it was an entire complete system 700 modular synthesizer. And then it's like, oh, wow. hang on, there's more here. Like there was just like so much stuff. And she doesn't know, and it's part of her, the collection that she is curating, but she doesn't like, she's not particularly interested in synthesizers as such. Like, and it's like, can we plug them in? And it's like, no, we, unfortunately, like they're here for the collection. You can't, you know, like, and if something would break because they haven't been plugged in for so long, you know, like you might ruin them or something. But it's just like, wow, there is a, such a VCS3, like all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Just and in this warehouse. Doing, why are they there? Are so they there? The, the idea is like all the museums are like that. Uh, I used to work at the Imperial War Museum. Like the, the collection is enormous. And the purpose is literally just to have it almost like a, a library for the nation of sort of historical items. And when they put on an exhibition, they will obviously look at like, what do we have in our you know, so because they're sort of seen as, and some of them have been donated by sort of famous people and by all sorts of stuff. So it's just part of the collection. They have like, I don't know how many fire fire engines they have. They have some sort of Daleks from Doctor Who and all sorts of stuff. I'm suddenly thinking of like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when he's wheeling. Do you know what? That's that's what it looks like. That yeah, that's that, yeah, that's 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 exactly the reference. That's what it looks like. There's all these boxes, and this is like, wow, what's in there? And you just, it could be so much cool stuff but yeah that was maybe wow. the best part of the entire job <laughs> wow mental so how how long were you uh, working there then at the science museum uh so this was my second time around so if i would add it up it would be so i was here for for four years now and then i was working there for one year earlier in my career right yeah so yeah i guess we could sort of begin to wrap it up now what yeah is, we should um... probably have sort of like eating eating your time this evening. oh no 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 not at all um so what is uh on the cards for the fellow passenger in the future what are your plans going forward for your so your yeah brand? So, so the 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 things that are going to happen is in a couple of weeks time it, it was meant to happen last year but all sorts of stuff other stuff happened getting the studio done. So that will be the first time in my life when I've been able to have all my hardware plugged in. So I think there's going to be more of a mix on my YouTube channel and it's going to be more hardware stuff as well. And not because most of it is pretty much Ableton at the moment. So that's a big thing that's going to happen. And I'm going to uh, I'm also going to post, start posting regularly now. I've got, I uh, can't remember how many videos, I've got about like six or seven in the pipeline that they need a bit of editing and things, but there is content happening again. So this summer, I'm really going to make a big push. Um, and also trying to, I'm, I started something last year with a couple of friends because we just realized that we we were just not particularly good at finishing music. I don't know if you have that problem sometimes too. So we... I, we, it's, it, it's, it's a topic of conversation for certain. Yeah. And, and one that I think I'd like to have with a group of people at some point is that how we, how we deal with that. So yeah. we decided like, the, yeah, it's two mates of mine. We decided we all sort of live quite sort of spread out in the UK, but we decided like the last Sunday of every month, we should have made, we should have finished something. And you'd just better do it the night before if you haven't done anything. But it's literally just getting into the routine of finishing things. 
So yeah. we've done that for just over a year now. There's been some months just because of work, but now back on track again. And finishing music has actually made me better at finishing music. I mean, it's, it's sort of a meta thing. So I, I have released a couple of things. It's just like an online thing. There's a label called um, Point Source Arts where I've released a few things and I'm going to do some more stuff with them. But I would just like to get some more finished music out there because it's sort of embarrassing. I think for the amount, the, the, the length of time I have made music, like I got my first synthesizer in 96, I think, and then I'd already been making music on the Amiga. I should be really good by now, but I'm not really. I, I am not well, really. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Like it, it's it, it's a tricky one, and it, it like I say, it's it's such a, a rich topic for conversation, um, and I'd love to hear loads of people's perspective on it because my my perspective on it is always changing, and I, I think it really depends on how much I'm invested in or how much one is invested in something. If I, if, if I'm quite invested in something, it can take a very, very long time for me mm. to finish it. If I don't give a shit about it, then it's done in 20 minutes, you know, cause it's just like, all right, whatever I did. Music that. by numbers. That's a, yeah, yeah. It's just like, well, numbers. okay. Like I had, the, I had that moment and that, that's got, I'm done with that now. And, um, I think there's quite a lot of sort of, um, kind of like psychology that can go, that, that, that that that's there to be discussed in that type of thing um i won't do it now what i'll do is i'll um get a bunch of us together and i'll invite you along and we can have a conversation conversation about that yeah. together because i think it's pretty interesting i think a lot of people out there are curious to hear other people's perspectives on that so i think that for me it's going to be getting the studio done it's going to be more hardware videos will be released again i'm going to make some more music and somehow get it out there because yeah like i said done music for so long but i think maybe one of the problems is that i've never ever made much of an effort of actually getting it out to any form of audience you know like it's literally been something that i've done and sometimes you've played it to a few friends who don't necessarily care that much about electronic music and then nothing happens really but just i, I think just starting the youtube thing and I think the Instagram was really the, the big thing during lockdown when I started posting there, that all of a sudden you started getting feedback. And I think that's just helped me to do more and develop. And yeah, so I, I'm going to get more music out there as well in one way or another. I don't know. Distro kid, put it on Spotify. I don't know what I want to do, but. Okay. Well, I wish you all the best with that. And Thank I you. will be, I will be keeping a keen eye an ear on that cheers um yeah I'll, I'll let you know when i've done my um only what was the constraints now using your sample you just got to make an entire track of one sample out of your library yes oh well whatever you want but yeah if you okay. want take it from that library i sent you yeah <laughs> um okay well okay. thank you very much for your time thank it's you been great it's been nice chatting um do uh come along to the meet meetups i'm organizing and if i'm doing another one of these in the future with a group of people do come along um, definitely yeah I and i'm going to get onto your discord and i think now this summer is going to be way easier for me to find the time so yeah we will see me yeah there. get on the discord um get involved in the li this little community that's bubbling uh on my on my patreon and um i will put all of your information I think I, I maybe I'll just put put your link tree in the description or anything yeah. you want to send me that you want me to put in the video description. I'll put it in there so people yeah. can. Yeah, uh, I can send you that drum and bass track from ninety five, ninety six, or whatever it was. Yes. <laughs> and Made also on the, Amiga. The, um, the the thing with the uh, the camera. Yeah, yeah. Because you fine. you sort of skimmed through that. Yeah. Um, but that. yeah, anything you want to send me, I'll put it in the description. And uh, yeah, nice one. Yep. Yeah, take care. Okay.